Hello. Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, third day of our international webinar series on epidemics, body and medicine. And today we have very uh, two very interesting speakers with us. First is uh, Dr. Shori Patacharya with his uh, topic. The to uh, title of his topic is Colonial Epidemics and the True Reform, Reading Keepling and Sharad Chandra. So Dr. Shori Patacharya, uh, I on the behalf of Department of English would like to welcome you to this talk today. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. First of all, um, to Gokul Memorial College and um, Rajkumar Borman, the head of department, for for the kind invite, and also uh, to Shubham Shubham Dattu, who has been constantly in touch, and to all of you, to the team who have organized this seminar and this webinar, rather. Um, thank you so much, and I have been listening to as much as possible throughout in the last two days, and I've really enjoyed some of the discussions uh, throughout. So um, my talk today is, as the title says, Colonial Epidemics and Literary Form, Reading Kipling and Sorochandra. Before I go there, just want to make sure once again that I'm uh, perfectly audible, right? Um, sir, uh, sir, sorry okay, to interrupt uh, you, but if we yeah. could just formally introduce you and then uh, maybe you can start. Is that okay with you? It is yes, perfectly sir, all right, but I'm just yes, trying sir. to make sure that I'm, I'm audible, right? Yes, you are absolutely audible. Yes, sir. Okay. Here, please, so please allow me to uh, give a brief uh, introduction of Dr. Shori Patacharya. Uh, Dr. Shori Patacharya is a lecturer in post-colonial studies in the Department of English Literature at the University of Glasgow. Uh, he was formerly assistant professor of English at IIT Rorke. Uh, he has uh, studied uh, in Presidency College and Yadavpur University and his MPhil degree in social sciences from the center of uh, Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya has done his PhD degree in English and Comparative Literary Studies from the University of Warwick. And he wrote a thesis on literary writings of the 1943 uh, Bengal famine, the Naxalite movement and the emergency. He has also written a book based on the thesis is uh, a book, uh, sorry, a book based on the thesis is forthcoming from Palgrave and he's currently involved in two other books uh, first, a monograph on global post-colonial literature today and an edited volume on the radical Bengali writer Nabarun Bhattacharya. His works have appeared or are forthcoming in uh, such journals as Area Textual Practice, Irish uh, University Review, Interventions and in edited volumes including the aesthetics and the politics of global hunger, uh, Cambridge Critical Concepts, Magical Realism. Uh, Shawit's interests are of uh, areas of interest include post-colonial and world literatures, environment, humanities, global realism, uh, materialistic aesthetics, and translation studies. Okay, over to you, Sarna. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's uh, very elaborate and very kind of you. Um, so the thing yeah. is, um, so the, the title as I'll, I'll just go straight to the talk and find out um, uh, how to sort of you know deal with two very different writers writing about epidemics. Um, so as you can understand, there are two parts of the talk. The first part is mostly to deal with these two keywords, colonial epidemics and literary form, and then uh, with Shorachandra and Kipling. So I'll go one by one. Um, this is something that I wanted to start with. Uh, this is from a book that I was recently reading called Empires of Panic. Um, this is a book where uh, this is edited by Robert Peckham, and he starts uh, the talk. And I'll start also uh, in my in my uh, talk with the with the idea that I'm going to be explaining some of the things rather than reading out from a paper because I've found um, a sort of being more conversational helps uh, getting to getting to some of these more uh, sort of challenging ideas and thoughts. So any questions and any ideas and comments you have, you're very welcome to do and to sort of pass them on to me uh, through through the team. So, um, so this is the this is what Robert Peckham in his introduction to Empires of Panic writes. For many colonial agents, Asia's unruly vastness appeared to defy classificatory logic. The 19th century records of the Dutch East Indies, for instance, reveal the uncertain knowledge of those who governed and the unease generated by rumors of local dissent. Rather than evincing the operations of a centralized and sagacious colonial state, the document disclosed 
pervasive doubt and uncertainty. And he goes on, colonial insecurity prompted the creation of ring-faced spaces in claves of certitude to mitigate and uh, the quote and, uh, that, that he takes from, in definite and pervasive anxiety about being lost in empire, something that he takes from Ronojit Goh's classic studies on colonial anxiety. Why do I start with the quote? Point being that colonial, colonialism itself as a system and colonial agents, when they came to India from far away lands, the most difficult part for colonial agents were to understand what India or Asia was, because this was radically different from some of the other places that they have traded with. If I take that, most of these colonial agents have come or had come during that moment to trade with uh, the Asians. And you know about East India Company as a trading agent, or even before that, East Indies, Dutch East India Company, French East India Company, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are like trading agents. So they came to trade and they realized that not only was Asia or India, um, a very strong, they had a very strong civilization, which had probably been already told to them, to the Europeans through various travel writers or through various trade um, merchants, etc. But also that it's a vast territory, it's huge. And how do I control? And if once East India becomes like from a trading center to more of a, um, let's say, an outpost of the government, uh, more of a government itself, how do I control, understand? Um, sort of map out the territory before I even understand how to do trade with, with these people, understand the geographies, cultures, and languages, which are vast and which are very uh, different from each other. So um, in, a, in, a, in a moment, um, uh, just a minute, please. Yeah, uh, because all these uh, virus um, things, sort of virus, interesting that antivirus update just came through, and I'm talking about virus and uh, epidemics. So the um, point being that, um, once again, to come back to the point that it was tough for them sort of um, map out, design and control a territory which is impossible, which is vast, very vast. And it is interesting that I, I, I find it because uh, one of the writers that I'm dealing with today, Kipling, um, in a story uh, called The Phantom Rickshaw, and the story that I'm going to be talking about is taken from the Phantom Rickshaw and uh, Phantom Rickshaw and other stories. This Phantom Rickshaw starts with this statement from Kipling that, uh, or rather, rather say Kipling's narrator, that India, one of the one of the advantages that India has over Britain is that it's great knowability uh, with a capital K. And um, then it goes on. And the interesting part is that the story is about certain a ghost and certain appearances or apparition that uh, the main character will not be able to understand. And that's precisely why, um, and he'll be considered uh, mad in the end, and precisely why he'll be writing these things in a diary. The irony of it, that it is the great knowability, because we Europeans have arrived with uh, machinery, a system of knowledge to learn, to know, to logicize, so to say, to sort of reason out. And then we see things happening, which we do not have a rational understanding about, maybe occults maybe superstitions, maybe rituals, etc. All these things made writings about empire by imperialists or colonial agents. A, a central trope is about uncertainty. And it is going to be very important for our reading today that uncertainty is behind the plot, the plotting of a story. That uncertainty drives um, the uncertainty within the plot and the uncertainty of the structures. The, the difficulty, the challenge of knowing a territory. Now, to come back to the central question of colonial epidemics. Now, we know about epidemics is that epidemics have been there. It's not that it's an invention of the Britain. Epidemics have been there for, for as long as, um, you know, as, as far as, as we could go back. And uh, some of the documentation that we have found that uh, sort of, um, you know, sort of Periclean Athens far back to, um, to the mid medieval century, medieval England, or even um, you know, sort of ancient India in Sanskrit, we have seen many of the instances of smallpox, um, of plague, of different kinds of epidemics, even cholera, etc., being there, and they have been talked about throughout. Um, it is so. What is so colonial about an epidemic? Um, think about the term itself: epidemic, epo, from epis upon demis or demos, the demic part, people, upon the people, something that falls on the people, something which is 
which afflicts an, an entire people, an entire uh, collectivity, the entire, if we can th think about that, the entire country people. So epidemics has this, this entirety, this enormity with it. It is not like an everyday fever, um, or it is not like, um, let's say, let's say a cut, uh, something that afflicts you, like in a cut in a body or something like that. It is just everybody's part of it. That's the epidemic word. So what is colonial about it? Uh, let me give you a couple of reasons. And this is these are things that I, I pose rather as a series of considerations. And I draw from a couple of um, some of these some of these historians and anthropologists who have worked in the last two or three decades about an area worked and carved out an area called the colonial um, science of colonial medicine or science of colonial technology um, and also the history of science so to say so um what am i going to be talking about is that um if we start from 1757 the battle of Plassey as the beginning of colonialism to some extent, like um, British colonialism in India till 1947, we'll see that this is the period, and because British were prone to document, unlike in other uh, periods, be it in the, it's not that the Mughal period or the Gupta period did not document, but the craze with which people documented within colonialism, the bureaucracy that it gave birth to was from colonialism. So to document, as you can understand, is also to document something, is also to allay the fear of the unknown to document, to keep something in, in, in record, um, uh, so something which can be uh, chronicled, which can be historicized. So this is also to deal with like how to sort of deal with the fear of not being able to know of the vast territories and, and their own cultures and, and different kinds of diseases. Now, um, as I said, there have been plenty of epidemics already in the in the years leading to, so let's say, 1757. But between 1757 and 1947, there were far more, so many that this period of colonialism could, and, and Sumit Sarkar, the modern historian of modern India, said that the period could be called a period of disasters and epidemics and catastrophes. Now, I'm not going into how many epidemics happened. That's not part of the talk. Uh, you can find out yourself. There are plenty of uh, documentation already. Indeed. Um, a historian Sisha, uh, Sasha Tendon writing um, about colonial epidemics in Punjab says that between 1850 and 1947, there were uh, all kinds of, there were like 50 lakh people, five, uh, sort of 5 million, sorry, um, sort of 50 million people who died in epidemics. And uh, this came out in an article called Colonial Epidemics in Punjab. Now, um, the Bombay, like, I mean, I, I work on the famines and I see like how many people um, actually perished because of the famines between uh, the 19th and 20th centuries. But the Bombay plague, to give you an idea that the Bombay plague in 1896 it itself uh, perished 10 million people. That influenza that we are talking about today, 100 years back, the same influenza killed uh, in two waves, about 200, about 20 million people. In the second wave, killed almost like 12 to 15 million people. So these are all numbers, okay? We can't even imagine how much is 20 million people dying. But these, when you were statistically putting them into your record, these become numbers. But when you live with them, they become tragedies. They become, they, be, they need catharsis. Numbers don't need catharsis in the same way that bodies need catharsis. Uh, kind of an emotive uh, release. Now, because of this, because of this recurrence of disasters and epidemics, um, different kinds of rituals also came up, which were understood to appease the gods and the goddesses of these epidemics. Uh, my my point here would be to first of all situate very quickly again from a few uh, quotes from David Arnold and a few other people have drawn from that how, what was colonial about these epidemics and then move on to um, the literary part. So uh, once again, to, to remind you that if these epidemics happened so recurrently, then it also caused, a, of course it had to cause a moment of concern for the colonial agents who were based in, uh, in Calcutta, Madras or Bombay or elsewhere in India and had to report back to, to London, to Britain. So, so what happened is that the first major, like 19, uh, I'll, I'll start with this, that 1770 famine in Bengal uh, was a major concern for the British. Um, and Warren Hastings was there by the time as the Lord, Lord Governor, I think. And he had to go through some of these legal um, sort of um, consequences. 
But it was in 1817, the almost 60 years after the British had established themselves in, in India, or mostly in Bengal and the eastern provinces, it was in 1817, the first cholera epidemic broke out. And cholera epidemic was known as, uh, by back that time, as an Asiatic cholera. So somebody who is writing uh, about cholera would always write that Asiatic cholera. And um, it's not that cholera had not been there in Europe, but the Asiatic cholera had a much more fatalities, much more um, sort of uh, catastrophic impact. Now, to talk about uh, sort of cholera in, in 1817, when uh, some of these documents, there are, no, there are no documents to fall back on. What the British agents we see are doing at the writing and uh, 18, 10, 20, 30, 40, these are like plenty of writings coming out about uh, about these epidemics and how actually people deal with these epidemics and what the British could, uh, if they had to, what they could do. Of course, in 1817, they were themselves not sure whether they're going to be ruling a country. They were like more interested in trading and sort of making sure that they can, you know, take as much wealth or however you read it, they can do as much um, administration, etc. Now, from 1857 onward, when there was a ruling, official ruling from um, from the from the British government that India becomes British India, so that is when it becomes much more uh, widely doc like the point of policy comes in. Like uh, from 1817, the discussions about cholera to 1866, uh, when again another cholera epidemic broke out, we could see that sea changes of understanding have taken place. Now, now cholera, something people dying, has become a matter of political and social concern, even in England, uh, in Britain, some of the discussions taking place, because this is also the time that vehement industrialization, etc., is happening from within England and giving birth to very difficult social, um, uh, challenging social life, social living, or sort of, you know, um, some of these novels of Dickens and um, Elizabeth Gaskell, etc., would, would give you an understanding about what was happening in Britain during that period, especially with the working class and uh, the workhouses, the work um, sort of this sort of factories, the lives of the now think about this. So the question of how to live so that uh, in such a fashion so that um, any kind of epidemic, the very traumatic um, example of which was the Black Death or the Great Plague in London, etc., wouldn't come back. So the point was to go for sanitation. The point was to make sure that there is there's enough cleanliness and hygiene that is taken into concern. And this is also the period, 1860s and 70s, when sanitation and hygiene debates are very public. One of the most noted public figures would be Florence Nightingale. And, and many of these figures would be involved in. And Florence Nightingale had never visited India, but has written extensively on India. And so on, based on some of the documents, think about the reliability on those documents that Florence would receive in London, and then write about what needs to be done in India without visiting them. And they were like, pretty powerful and very um, strong and very, I, I would rather say some of these letters that I've written, some of these pr proposals that I've, I've read by uh, Nightingale to show that how well she she judged some of these some of these issues. Though, of course, the nuances of it, the caste and the religious nuances of it were not uh, very well um, sort of understood by, perceived by Nightingale. But, but to give you an understanding that this was there. And then by 1894, when the plague comes in Bombay, we see that already a whole troop of uh, uh, sort of colonial machinery uh, is, is on, the, on, the, on the go. So sort of buses and trains are being checked where there are like people who uh, show symptoms. And then pilgrims are being given like uh, tests uh, inoculation tests, etc., before they take pilgrimage. Uh, people, disinfectants are everywhere. So whatever we see almost 120 years later today in an epidemic or rather a pandemic, you could always see some of these things happening in the 1890s onward in the British colonial state. So that is also giving birth along with law, discussions on law, engineering and planning. Medicine and these sanitation discourses are giving birth to a notion of modern India that we can take care of our diseases, etc. that we can map out, find out. This is also, if you remember, 1890s and 19, uh, first decade of 20th century is also something leading to the discovery of malaria, uh, of, of the mosquitoes behind malaria, etc. and Ro Ronald Ross getting the, getting the prize, etc. So point and uh, point being that these were all, and Kipling was a, was a very good friend of Ro Ronald Ross. They would be um, exchanging letters uh, between them. So in some, in some ways or the other, 
um, most of these writers writing about some of these uncertainties were also taking part in some of the scientific discourses in a public forum or in a public uh, manner. They're writing in newspapers in the same way that we see some of the public intellectuals will be taking part in some of the public forum. So if this is, uh, so point being that epidemics to some extent, if we can read it in that way, the colonial part of the epidemics is that not only would it sort of push them to think about how to deal with the territory and its diseases, but also to give birth to what we know as the modernity. That, that's the colonial part of it. But interestingly, it's, it's slightly more um, forward thinking, in a sense, it's slightly more different. So I'll give you like a couple of examples so, um, to, 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 for you to evaluate this part. So what is David Arnold uh, writing in his, um, in his uh, essay, Colonialism and Cholera in British India, which was published in 1986. So what he is writing is that the first epidemic of the 19th century, that is 1817 cholera outbreak, came hard on the heels of the most active and decisive phase of British expansionism. When the cholera erupted in 1817, the English East India Company had held control of Bengal for 60 years, but only in the previous 20 had its territorial power been extended into large areas of southern and northern India. The arrival of the epidemic in Western India in July and August 1818 coincided with the final defeat of Maratha power and thus the Sikhs and the, of the Punjab apart with the extension of sustained military exposition, uh, opposition to British domination. The connection between cholera and conquest was not fortuitous. Troops were particularly susceptible to a disease that flourished in the insanitary and crowded conditions of barracks and encampments, and they, in turn, were among the principal agencies by which the disease was disseminated throughout India. Now, this is something that we need to think about again, um, about how, how, how uh, cholera is an epidemic, and we know about coronavirus, right, that, that it's, not, it's coming from elsewhere. It's being transported, carried forth. So, this is also with cholera that and an interesting part is that at Arnold's uh, shows in 1986 that it was transported and some of these things could uh, help us see that it might be that the uh, troops and the military agents might be the first transporters because of the expansions British colonialism throughout India of the cholera uh, bacteria. Now this is uh, if if cholera has been there before the British had come then how were the how were the villages or the, the Indians the natives are responding to them now, some of you may already know about uh, smallpox and uh, the goddess Sitala or Shitala. That uh, smallpox had been there much before, and then the village, the native people, had already uh, ritualized it and invented, or we um, already gave birth, gave form to it, to something that we don't understand. And this is precisely what we do: we try to give something that we don't understand, some sort, some sort of a cognizable form. And the form that we give here is the form through uh, a Devi, the goddess, who would help us get past it. That was the whole point. But as David Arnold says, cholera, by contrast, and I quote him again, by contrast, had not been extensively ritualized by the early 19th century. There are several possible explanations for this. The symptoms of cholera were less distinctive than the pockmarks and blindness that were common legacy of smallpox. There was no equivalent technique of inoculation for which to evoke a goddess's blessing. And perhaps most dis significantly cholera, though certainly present, appears to have been as widespread and as destructive as it became after 1817. So in a sense, what happened is there was not uh, not an act sort of, um, let's say, um, a vocabulary and an aesthetics or a cultural ritualized aesthetics uh, that was that was already present that were present for cholera. And I keep uh, coming back to cholera because I want to make sure that our discussions are focused only on one epidemic so that it remains sort of uh, integral and coherent to whatever I'm going to be reading out about literature as well. So what happens is, so as you can understand that there was no, but at the same time, so for instance, another uh, historian, Aurobindo Shamanto, who has written a book called Living with Epidemics in Colonial Bengal. And this is uh, something that he has written that even um, in the in the uh, Sanskrit times, and we have something called the word called Mari, um, the Hindustani name, and I'm quoting from him, the Hindustani name was Mari or deadly disease, a word evidently derived from the same root as Latin Mari or English Moraine. Cholera in many parts of India was called Mari or Juri Mari. From there, the name came as Mohamari. And in Sanskrit, the word was Vishuchika. 
And then there are like different stages of Sanskrit words like alasika, vilambika, etc., etc., associated with cholera. And both Susruta and Charata have talked about it. So as I said in the beginning, that people have talked about cholera in Indian writings, etc., but in Indian uh, medicinal discourses, etc. But um, there was also uh, there was also associated metaphors and symbols and words such as mari. But what Aurobindo Samanto also says is that um, by something that David Arnold also uh, talks about in 1986 is that already in some of the more localized native religions and cultures, uh, rituals and cultures, there were already uh, a Devi, um, a presence of a significant symbolical uh, being. So Ola Bibi, for instance, is one example where uh, this sort of um, this sort of form giving and finding out a catharsis, an emotive collective catharsis that let's let's uh, let the God is to help to help uh, the God or the God is to help out is there. Is, and what is happening is that when uh, the British, so what is happening is after the 1817 cholera is that somebody would be painted. So one of the native ways to communicate about cholera was somebody would be uh, made into a sacrifice, a scapegoat, would be painted and then sent away from one village to another. Now, most of the times that uh, David Arnold also says that it is something to do with somebody who is lower caste, somebody who is a prostitute, a woman. And it reminds me of some of the talk that Professor Omrit Sen gave in the, uh, on the first day about women and the bodies. And I was just thinking about how certain things um, were there in the, in the Indian scenario in the first, in the, uh, in the first half of the, of the 19th century um, epidemic context. But at the same time, and it is it is probably going to be useless to think about uh, or meaningless to think that already uh, cholera happened without any caste barriers or without any religious barriers. Of course, some of these things would happen. And the British response to uh, these things would be that they were, and I, I take from um, uh, Claudius Buchanan, some of the things that he has said about that more often uh, the, the responses to native to native work would be obscene religions. Uh, remember what Churchill said, beastly, beastly religion, beastly race, obscene. I can't under see the going back again to the former remark that I can't understand something. So this is something that comes back again and again that I can't understand. That's precisely why I give a form and that is obscene. In the same way that the natives would say, I can't understand what kind of a disease is that. So I give it a form, which is like, you know, a form of, because we are so-called pagans, a form of a god, let's say a god of, um, a god of cholera, a goddess of cholera, who would be given uh, a sacrifice, an offering, and be appeased. Uh, so, in a sense, this, th these were things that happening in the 19th century. But at the same time, it would be also important to know that uh, though the colonial um, agents and the Western medicine always showed its superiority um, in terms of its medicine and in terms of its race throughout, uh, that we did we we know better. But at the same time, we see that important interactions are taking place between colonial medicine and uh, native medicine especially Vades and Hakims and uh, sort of, you know, sort of cholera pills are coming out, pills made up of opium um, and, and black pepper and asophytita. These are pills that are coming out, etc. Now, um, apart from that, of course, as I said, the caste aspect is very clear. So is the gender and the race aspects. And uh, Sasha Tandon writes that um, about about the gender aspect, especially the women's uh, aspect is that, and she says that they were like, women were much more subjected to fatalities and deaths. And I quote her, there seems to have been, and I quote her, a connection between the higher incidence of disease and mortality among women and the prevailing patriarchal structure compared to their male counterparts, women could benefit much less from the plague, inoculation and smallpox vaccination. This was due to ignorance as well as the general disregard for women's health, unquote. Again, she goes on to talk about the racial aspects of it. And again, a very quick quote, um, uh, the cholera outbreak at Amritsar was traced to the Kashmiri of Mohammedans who were considered filthy beyond the ordinary filth of the inhabitants of the Punjab in their persons and clothing. Their houses reeked with concentrated effluvia of long accumulated faecal dejecta of the tops with their floors and courtyards and mere cesspools of urine and various sweepings of the household." Unquote. So point that I wanted to give here very clearly is that some of these responses, popular responses to cholera, something that probably was brought by the European, that was the native feeling about it, or uh, whatever it was, some of these popular responses were intersected uh, responses with caste, religion, and um, gender. And these are things that we need to think about when we uh, read them in, 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 in literature especially in uh, representation, how was they represented? So to come back to the second part of the literary form, and I'll be quicker here um, because the whole point was to give you a framework to think about that. So um, 
one of the problems representing with representing epidemics is that you 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 don't know what to represent especially the virus is not there unlike uh, a war where there are people fighting you can represent photograph that you can represent that you can represent the fighting the moment the death the sort of you know, maybe like somebody whose body has been torn apart like the tragic moments of it uh, or think about uh, even the refugee crisis the boy alan kurdi whose body was washed ashore that created a sensation throughout in the world so these are things that could be represented what do you represent about a cholera or a virus what you represent is the death the corpses the bodies flying around uh, sort of you know lying around on the streets etc so in a sense this has become very difficult for literary writers and crit literary critics to talk about representation or deal with representation so in one of the very recent books called viral modernism the influenza epidemics and interwar literature elizabeth woodcar writes and this was to 2019 uh, book she writes it uh, and i quote her this book investigates a modernist mystery this is how she starts the book This book investigates a modernist mystery. Why does the deadly 1918-1919 influenza epidemic seem to make so few appearances in British, Irish, and American literature of the period? If this, and I unquote her, if this influenza kills so many millions of people, 50 million of people, where does it appear in the literary and cultural works? Why does it not appear so widely? What is it that that help that prevents us from writing or talking about that? Is it because the life is so engrossing during that period that we want to forget about that? Think about the current time period. So engrossing about Corona, so much violence going on, so much tragedy. Shall we? Do we stop writing about that? Thinking about that? Does aesthetic representation become exhibitionism? Some sort of a moral problem is associated with it. Something that probably gives us a much better understanding because we are going through some of these phases. By better, I mean not, of course, not knowing fully well that any term of this. Uh, might be sort of triggering for a lot of us so just to give you um like more maybe a sharper understanding of what is going through so this is if she finds so difficult think about you know this has not been done. and i'm working on famine and i find it so uh, less writing about famine both by writers and also by uh, critics so for instance to go back uh, one of the most celebrated works was by uh, on illness or on uh, narrative medicine etc would be by susan sontag in 1978 she wrote a book uh, published a book called um, illness as a metaphor that illness has been um, always talked about in terms of metaphors very quickly metaphors and metaphors dehumanize metaphors discourage humans to talk about illnesses they need to be sort of demetaphorized then later on in the in the 20th and 21st century so this is uh, what rita cheron writes in her book narrative medicine and she says that a serious illness creates a diffuse horror a sense that something of value has abandoned that a deep and nameless sadness has settled in at home accompanied by the jarring jolting inarticulate presence of the dread how do you talk about that then priscilla wold another uh, historian of outbreaks uh, and uh, sort of um, epidemics and pandemics she writes a book 2008 called contagious cultures carriers and the outbreak narrative where she talks about how um, ambiguous and borderless qualities of an illness make it hard to describe a challenge dramatically compounded when a singular experience of illness is part of a borderless outbreak across the globe so this is something that i'm thinking about that more and more i have seen that the difficulty has been talked about and 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 elizabeth's book uh, elizabeth woodcus book is about how a number of writers have both written about uh, the influenza also sort of drawn upon them not written directly say uh, t s eliot's the westland or virginia will be mrs dalway so so this is something that she does but she she struggles to find out enough literature about that now this is something to come back again to call rather to to our own to our own uh, coronavirus pandemic and some of the scenes of violence beat the migrant crisis beat some of the deaths that we see it becomes very difficult like how do we represent this particular it's not about me i'm not a literary a uh, creative writer but i'm sure like if there is a paucity of writing then there is of course there is the challenge of representing it and this is what i feel um, a number of critics especially go working on going back again to the victorian part the victorian uh, sort of gothic colonial epidemics part is that some people such as such as patrick brantlinger finding out that more and more writers use spectral metaphors ghosts demons zombies etc to define the dead he calls it the imperial gothic then pablo mukherjee calls uh, writings by kipling especially about cholera and epidemic as gothic realism again and then um, Rob Nixon also has talked about something called slow violence things that we do not see so the point is that these are the the frameworks to give you that to how to understand how to read uh, something from within text which 
the, the authors of which found it difficult to, or challenging to sort of represent in in their in their um, sort of creative form. So to give you a couple of quick examples from uh, Kipling and Sholot Chandro, I'm not going to be introducing these writers because plenty of it uh, already has has been written on uh, on both of them. Of course, like much more on Kipling. Um, Kipling's um, was was based mostly in India and writing mostly out of India and, and the US. Um, so Kipling's noted novel is of course Kim. Um, which was published in uh, 1900 and has plenty of sections on malaria. And I'm not going to be going into the novel form. So is Shorat Chandra, who is Kipling and Shorat Chandra are almost contemporaries. We can say that they, one of, was born in 1965, died in 36. That is Kipling. Shorat Chandra born in uh, 80. Sorry, Kipling born in 1865, dying in 1936. Shorat Chandra 1876, dying in 1938. So they are like uh, contemporaries in in their publications as well. So one of them uh, is writing about malaria and Kim. Then the other person, Shorat Chandra, is writing about plenty. I think Shorat Chandra is probably the novelist to go to in Bengal in Bengali talk who talks about uh, extensively about some of these epidemics documents them in a literary manner so you, you can think about Pondit Moshai that uh, novel the village school teacher which is about cholera then you can think about Srikanto again um, and then you could think about Pothir Dabi uh, so the, the uh, Pothir Dabi is about the influencer so he I mean there are plenty of other novels talking about that um, Kipling also does it in the Victorian sense, but both of them are dealing with these things in a different way, as we, as can be expected. Now, I'm going to be talking about a couple of short stories. Kipling, The Strange Ride of Murubi Jukes, and Lalu, uh, Sholot Chandra's Lalu. Many of you may already know about that. So what is happening in Kipling's story, The Strange Ride of Murubi Jukes? Murubi Jukes is a civil engineer, and he... Um, uh, I'm just like making sure that I don't take enough time um, just to explain to give you uh, some some time to think about as well. Uh, so this is the, the second part of it, okay, Kipling and Shorot Chandru, and we've defined uh, to go back to colonial epidemics and uh, how literature is di uh, it's difficult for literature to represent. So um, to come back to Kipling, Morobi Jukes is a is an engineer, um, a civil engineer who is uh, posted in a in a far away uh, village in Rajasthan in Bikaner, and. He's going through. He, he the, the the story starts when he has some sort of a fever, and there is there are dogs barking, and he doesn't like it, and he wants to go out and see, and then probably kill, etc. That's the whole point. And then he mounts on a horse, and then goes out, split, uh, sand everywhere. It's a moonlit night, almost like um, beautiful in that sense. Uh, some of these descriptions, and then suddenly what happens is he falls. Um, into something. And then we realize later on the, the next day he wakes up and realizes that he is in a ravine and he um he is sort of some sort of a let's say a crater, a huge crater of, of sand. And um then he realizes slowly as the story goes on that he realizes that there are people who are living there and these people are not dead, they are not living as well. So he got to know when he uh, sort of arrived in uh, Bombay from an armenian uh, friend of his that there are there are houses there are villages where uh, people who do not die as if they are dead after all the um, sort of crematory rites are done suddenly they they sort of um, are coming back to life because suddenly if they they're alive again if they're alive again and i've heard about plenty of stories that the dead come back to life um, the last portion of it is so 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 a hakim or a boito is is given the the last uh, sort of chance and the last portion of it sort of bringing people back to life when almost they've been like almost uh, taken out from their from their um those from their rooms and will be taken to the ground the cremation ground so if people like that actually exist then they will be taken to another place and they will be living there because they are not living and they are not dead either suspended think about the zombies but they are not zombies um, or the current understanding of Hollywood zombies that we have. So what happens is, so we realize that these are people around. There are people who are living in tiny egg-shaped sort of holes inside that crater, and they come out and they talk and uh, they eat. What they eat? Sometimes they find crows. They they, they feast on crows, etc. And then uh, this Morobi jokes finds out, uh, meets with a, an Indian who can speak. His name is Ganga Das. And uh, he is a Brahmin, and he uh, reminds him that they, they met before, and he wants to help. But then again, uh, because it's written from the perspective of Murubi Jukes, and the story is written in a very interesting way, that somebody um, 
starts talking about so it's a frame story so the narrator says that it will not be wrong to talk about you know uh, many of us have heard about murobi jukes and he writes with such um precision that it will not probably be wrong to believe what he has said so let's see what he has said now it is all about murobi jukes so this is sort of a frame story so uh, murobi jukes is uh so more uh, so because it's from his perspective he finds ganga das to be very cunning shrewd and some of the descriptions of this place i'll just talk about a little later and then later on so they can never escape he realizes after plenty of attempts that they can never escape this person there are people actually holding guns rifles at them they will not be allowed to escape uh, and then realize that maybe people who either who had this disease and we realize that this is part of the cholera people who who were um this is the this is the colonial understanding of let's say quarantining you know in a, in a place and suddenly a colonial agent falls and he is some disoriented completely disoriented both by the quarantining aspects and also by uh, the disease that the camp the disease of the camp or the detention camp that, uh, the 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 stench of it and throughout the story he talks about that and then he tries to escape he doesn't and he feels uh, completely out of disbelief that he the colonial uh, agent the superior race cannot be allowed to escape and then finally he does escape and uh, gunga das also sort of escapes they don't meet and in between they have had like plenty of conflicting times trouble times in between now the uh, i'll just talk about um, let's say how he he sort of defines himself and um, uh, the 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 people that he sees so look what he what he what he um, consider what he says and i quote him i found myself in the midst of a crowd of spectators about 40 men 20 women and one child who couldn't have been more than 5 years old they were all scantily clothed in that salmon colored cloth which one associates with hindu mendicants and at first sight gave me the impression of a band of loathsome fakirs the filth and repulsiveness of the assembly were beyond all description and i shuddered to think what their life in the badger, in the badger holes must be and then again the ragged crew actually so he after he tries and he falls the ragged and this is what i quote the ragged crew actually laughed at me such laughter i hope i may have never heard here again they cackled yelled whistled and howled as i walked into their midst some of them literally throwing themselves down on the ground in convulsions of unholy mirth then again some of these technical uh, words that use uncouth tongues to spare them um, so uh, throughout and um, somebody who is was described as looked at the withered skeleton turbanless and almost naked with long matted hair and deep set this is the description of ganga das then again uh, when he has to uh, sort of sleep in in this particular holes and along with some of these people um right so this is what he um, again describes um about uh, about the impossibility of living with uh, with the stench and with some of these people so again so this is very clear that the description of natives the natives is actually represented by ganga das is a very deceptive cunning uh, classic kipling to the that if somebody helps he is a loyal somebody who is helping the sahib is a loyal somebody who is like talking with um in in sort of uh, with so some sense of power is cunning shrew these are like uh, kipling is a classics in that sense imperialist um writer and uh, edward said said about talked about that the kipling with kipling the colonial machinery and the colonial writing the first time were uh, perfectly in match um so what is he talking about him um and where does the problem the uncertainty the tension the ego hurt comes in uh, comes from and again a quote from the story um here was a sahib a representative of the dominant race helpless as a child and completely at the misery of this of his native neighbors in a deliberate lazy way he set himself to torture me as a schoolboy would devote a rapturous half hour to watching the agonies of an impaled beetle or as a ferret as a ferret in a blind burrow might glue himself comfortably to the neck of a rabbit the burden of his conversation was that there was no escape of the kind whatsoever and that i should stay here till i died and was thrown on to the sand so this is the, the something that he calls the inexplicable terror uh, throughout that he that, that how could a sahib of his race be sort of you know uh, told to do things and clearly this sort of um, post colonial readings of kipling have been pretty wide and i'm not going to go into that with the liminality hybridity etc etc the laughing of the mockery the mimicry i'm not going to go into that the point is to come back again through the epidemics part and the imagery so 
what we can understand from this course is that the natives are not here. They are like a formless abstract outside. Ganga Das is a representation of a cunning native. And there is a person who is at misery and he wants to leave. And despite being from the more uh, noted, more uh, knowledgeable race, he's not being allowed to sort of, you know, take the task to himself. Um, and then there are like plenty of descriptions of that. So again, uh, another um, tiny quote, I, a civil engineer, a man of 13 years standing in the service, and I trust an average Englishman should thus calmly threaten murder and violence against the man who had for a consideration, it is true, taken me under his wing. So throughout this, this, this realizations that uh, how could I uh, even talk about murder and violence, we being civility and civilization, so I'm not going to go into, into some of, uh, again, more into this. So if this is something that he has seen, then what is the descriptive imagery of the of the places? Something like that. And I, I want you to think about how uh, some of these places, some of the nights were described. Uh, to give you an understanding about what a colonial agent is thinking of, of the natives' um, places. So the horrors of the night, I shall never forget. My den was nearly as narrow as a coffin, and the sides had been worn smooth and greasy by the contact of innumerable naked bodies, added to which it smelled abominably. The entire amphitheater was filled with legends of unclean devils that trooping up from the shores below mocked the unfortunate unfortunates in their lairs. Again, throughout um, the next, next night, the descriptions is about um, the surface of the sand seems to be shaken with devilish delight at my uh, uh, disappointment. There's sort of this devilish throughout the, the descriptions, these terms will come back. So the description, or this is the second point that I wanted to, the description will make sure, because Kipling is not writing for Indians, right? He's writing for the metropolitan audience. The description will make sure that it is difficult to understand India, or, the, or rather that it is, it is a place full of devilish creatures. You know, something that you realize where some of this racism would come from. And uh, finally, what happens, he is, of course, is out and he goes out and he remembers that, you know, there was a help from an Indian um, sort of servant, Dhunu, who helps him out. And he realizes that he's, he's been the best man in his entire life, of course. So point being that uh, what we saw is that the superiority of a race has been has been uh, challenged by a cunning representative of a representative um, of the natives, which is formless, which is devious, which is um, delightful in the falls in the in the fall of a of a Englishman, and then the descriptive imagery that sort of give you understanding about the concept of the undead, something that cholera or any kind of epidemic would uh, lead to that somebody who is dead but not dead either, and and the sort of uh, tension that it brings back again, again about empire and colonization, about the anxiety to not being able to um, pinpoint not being able to control something which is beyond myself. Now, this is where I would like to stop with Kipling, but it's with Shorat Chandra again, very quickly, I chose Lalu precisely because Lalu is again, understood as a ghost story. It's a, it's taken from um, Shorat Chandra's collection uh, called Chelevalar Golpo, published in 1938. And um, Lalu here, as you say, a series of stories. One of the stories is, uh, this is the third story where Lalu um, is, so there is a there is a cholera a context here, and um, the point was to give you an understanding about when the natives are writing about cholera, um, especially in children's stories. And I'll, I'll end with the story part of it, the short story part of it, writing about cholera. How are they writing about them? What is it that? Uh, and that's precisely why I didn't want to go into the details with Pundit Moshe. Some of the scenes that come out in Pundit Moshe, but of course, I'd like you um, to read if possible if you want to know more about uh, the representation in novel in a, a native novel but what is happening here in this story is that somebody has died of cholera we don't know whether they have died of cholera but there is cholera all around and they are very difficult to find people who take us uh, like the dead bodies like help people um, with with people dying in their houses helping them with cremate the bodies and this is where gopal kuro comes in gopal kuro is always uh, there for help and gopal kuro has a team of uh, sort of um, his younger uh, sort of asp aspirants or maybe like admirers. And then one of them is Lalu. Lalu is um, understood as a fearless, um, at the same time, very sympathetic, very, or rather say very empathetic character who would like do something uh, because of his affection and because of his love for somebody else. And then Lalu and uh, Kuro, both are, so both of them, so all of them, so, so what they do is they take out the corpse and they take it to the cremation ground. And then there is a, 
there is a possibility uh, we, we realize that um, it would be raining soon and everybody seems like quality almost the description of the place is something uh, two o'clock in the morning uh, you feel like if there is a rain where do i go and there is nothing the description is that there is nothing even in um, half a mile or two miles so um but kopal guru says i'm not going to go anywhere leaving the dead the corpse but then then there is a uh sort of uh after after the rain what happens is when they come back and start with the setting of the pyre they realize that the dead a body is moving and first Moni says that to Kuro that Kuro look the dead body I think is moving then another person Noru who says that I think Kuro Moni is right the dead body but throughout Kuro says that what are you trying to fool me I mean I have I've been sort of um you know setting people to on fire and sort of helping with the with the cremation for so long I've, I've, I've had thousands of of these dead bodies cremated so you are trying to fool me and then what uh, they, they realize later on that actually it is uh shaking and then kopal kuru realizes when what happens is the dead body sits like uh it, it sort of not only moves and it's a very uh funny incident and it's uh then sits up and then says that no no i'm not going to be eating noru or moni i'm going to be eating kuro and then kuro realizes that uh much has been done now it's the right time to leave and then kuro actually leaves and goes to the towards towards the river and it's like almost like um floating and then lalu comes out of it the point being that lalu didn't want to go away from the dead body so he decided to get into under the quilt with the dead body and underneath the quilt and then uh then sort of um make sure that the hindu scriptures that they you cannot leave the dead uh, re, uh kept and then kuro although sort of rebukes him but he also knows that how brilliant of lalu's part to do that how fearless and courageous of lalu's part to do that etc point being here is that unlike if you think about kipling's story kipling's story was not meant entirely for children um but this is Golpa, mostly for children the childhood stories mostly for children but, uh and kipling's story was way longer and this is a very a short uh, story like two pages or something like that and there are not enough descriptive imagery to to be to be honest uh, about the nature etc there are moments where the moonlit and the sort of the ghostly spectral atmosphere when they uh when they put down the dead um on the on the earth and then the description is pretty much spectral but it is nowhere it is compared but this also the reason is that um very few uh, of these even Chandra's writings would actually talk about these descriptions in a haunting spectral manner it is more to do with uh the conflicts more to do with the problems the issues that he keeps coming back to Shorachandra is not somebody and these are different ways of dealing with it of course Shorachandra is not a Tarashankar Tarashankar is not a Vibhuti Bhushan but Shorachandra's take was very much uh, to put the issue into the societal conflicts, be it caste, be it gender, or be it religion. So Pandit Mahasaya also does that, coming back. So the scriptures already you know, dominating, the scriptures, the scriptural part of it, that you cannot, uh, the signs saying that you cannot wash your the, the, the clothes of the dead, which, which has been um, sort of pages by cholera into a tank into a water because it is a waterborne disease but then somebody like from the brahmins would be saying that what are you saying the sastra says that we can always do that we are bereft of it we are exempted from it so this is the conflict that Chandra is more happy to talk about so this is also here in lalu but because it's a children's story i think that some of these tropes come out but interesting part is that again as you can understand even in um even in two or three lines the characters of the natives are very well drawn out so for instance, talking about Bistu Pundit, whose wife has um, has perished, uh, in just two lines, like at least he gives you an understanding that there is a face, and he's talking about the face. Uh, so the school teacher, Bistu Pundit, his face looked bl blank, and I quote from Lalu, his face looked blank, helpless. Nothing in the world compares to, th to that look. Once seen, you can't forget it ever. Now, this kind of a emotional invested sort of description of somebody's helplessness automatically gives you a picture of that person the helpless faces that you have you can imagine then again um gopal kuru the in in tiny brushes uh, gopal kuru and lalu's character in sort of fast quick brushes have already been very well painted and don't go into that again so what happens is that throughout the story we see that 
the the certain the uncertainty with which people wrote it is more about certainty that i know that okay people have died we are here it's not that we, we don't know whether we're going to be getting called from them but it's just that it is more of a social collectivity that we and these are performances right that we need to we need to observe and because mr pundit is so poor he doesn't have anybody we have to be there that's the native part of it contra kipling that for chandra is dealing with again the second part i said about um kipling was the descriptive was that the formless face of a native that the formlessness and here the collectivity everybody has a face and everybody is given even in that particular short scape some sort of a um, recognition and that's very important because you are not only reading a story you're, tr you're also imagining something and this imagination is halted when kipling is describing it it's entirely focused on what um, roby jokes thinks and then the description of it this uh, scriptural fate etc is much more sensory much more effective there are plenty of uh, funny incidents though kipling and third part that i wanted to say though kipling uses humor uh, in a bit first and funny um poking fun at me look at them look, poking fun at me humor is more like satire there here it is like you can see them as they're laughing it's, it will create not that uh, any humor is depoliticized of course uh, humor is at the expense of something but you can see that there is a tendency from the author to deploy um, a certain form of humor that will make you feel as a child make you feel uh, that okay lalu is so courageous so idealized so um, so uh, aspiring uh, somebody to aspire to so finally the final part of the talk is that um, i wanted to give you an understanding of shorachandra and kipling and how they're using the short story format is interesting that i found out in lalu especially that uh, you would know that cholera would wouldn't almost appear in it doesn't properly i would say appear in the story it's just the first two lines okay and just uh, the first two lines begin like this my this is my translation it was only the first chills of winter and suddenly the cholera broke out uh, suddenly cholera broke out during those days people would be terrified to their bones at the very name of it if there was cholera a neighborhood in a neighborhood people would leave that place promptly if someone died it would be hard to find people who would help cremate the bodies so this is where the story starts so clearly people have left cholera is sort of around but there is also but we don't know whether bistu bondi's wife has died of cholera is she has died but there are people so that's the whole problem even if people are dying of no because nobody knows unlike uh, when are today's discussions about corona tests etc somebody dying later on knowing that tested positive there was no tests as such in 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 the uh, especially in villages there was no, no such sort of wonderful communication and uh, sort of um, you know dealing with the urban and the rural in also people can still complain that things have not been um, so uh, even but at the same time think about 1870s um, the village did not exist in the minds of a colonial agent right uh, this is so fast again so in a sense you never know whether it is cholera or it is natural death so what happens in the end is that the story is about that but cholera is there and it leaves and then if it is of cholera then you think and as an adult when you read it you think that lalu decided to get underneath is it because of his non knowledge his ignorance of cholera that it could be it could come to him and it was rainy and if it is uh, water borne then through rain i don't know we never know whether from dead bodies they pass on to another but we ne this question is not asked right and then uh, gopal kuru says you know it is um, he says it is the cholera mora that means the dead cholera dead so he decides so somewhere down the line there is a certainty that bistu bondi's wife died of cholera and if lalu had decided it is purely out of affection and devotion to the hindu scriptures and the dead that you cannot leave the dead that he has decided to do that but when you think about it and you, you realize that okay lalu is this courageous fearless and i read lalu this story when i was in the 6th or 5th or 6th standard somebody to look forward to like indranath like you know uh, huckleberry finn somebody to look forward to somebody who can transgress boundaries illicit desire somebody i cannot ever do something to look aspire to and then you realize later on that something that he is doing actually would be wrong 
that some you 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 are not supposed to do that right so in a sense that what you were supposed to do and what you are not supposed to do are also working in frames of knowledge which are allow, which allow certain things to be done from modernity's perspective and certain things not so somebody if somebody is nowadays worshiping corona as a devi as a goddess we are finding it laughable precisely because we don't understand what is going on if shitola came out as a goddess through um, some sort of a ritualistic imagery to give it form then corona is also the corona devi is also giving it form there are plenty of ways that people in villages and especially in other parts where they are in tussle with some of these knowledges they are not buying some of these modernities knowledges and um, you know you know calculations etc there are different ways of dealing with the catharsis this is to come back to the final part one way that shorachandra does with this is to give it form not only through corona not through corona devi or shitola devi but through the short story form so short story and uh, skipling and shorachandra the short the short story allows them to give you a slice of life that it was the repercussions that they have right now when i am reading them would be multiply different from uh, based on the times and spaces when you were reading it i'm reading it in at uh, in my 6th uh, or 7th standard had a different repercussion different impact and i'm reading it right now so i'm equally more um, sort of glad that i could read it and i'm equally sort of amused by the story uh, again but at the same time i can see that some of these things and was shorachandra so confident in the 30s and 40s when the cholera wouldn't come back again when there was like as david arnold says plenty of already state machineries had already been taken to make sure and there was no famine as such in the 21st century apart from the influenza epidemic there was not much uh in in bengal uh, and then leading to the famine of course which is understood as more of a man made one rather than uh, sort of some sort of an epidemic or a disease leading to that or some sort of food shortage only so point being that was it trying to make sure that cholera by giving it just two lines cholera is not the matter the matter is the courage of this person the warmth the collectivity that he feels but if so then would it not be wrong to do that in between these two lies kipling and shorachandra the point is not to be whether to go for the vaccines of corona or to go for kipling's understanding of certainty or to go for uh, rituals such as shitola devi or corona devi or to think about what lalu did the point is to realize that these are all popular responses and both of these responses are built upon how knowledge is built how one is given more superiority or more dominance than others and this is precisely where i think short stories aesthetics literary writings literary form literary style that can give a, give us an understanding of how to engage with them and the challenges that we find in, in readers in writers about engaging with them so with this i would like to stop uh, this presentation i'd like to know if there are any more uh, any any questions or suggestions so thank you so much for listening Sir, may I audit to you? Yes, yes sir. You so, Professor Krider, who was the uh, one of the keynote speaker, has also joined us in the studio today. And right. uh, ma'am, would you like to speak first? Um, I th I think uh, I should let others. Uh, ask questions. I, all I can say is that thank you, Shorit, for your uh, very good paper where you go back to colonial times and draw links with, uh, you know, modern events uh, and show how literature remains relevant in Kipling and Shorit Chandra. And um, I think it's very good that you give two different perspectives, both the colonial and the Indian national uh, perspective through Shorit Chandra and take a very, very short story uh, and show how mm, profound it is in the questions it raises uh, about um, social attitudes to uh, epidemics. So thank you very much. I enjoyed the paper, that's all. I'll leave it to others. Thank you so much. Piers, shall we start taking the questions? Yes, uh, Oinji. The first question that uh, has come in the comment section, this is from uh, uh, Devanjan Mitra. Uh, he writes, uh, how would you locate the notion of tension and ambiguity in the text that you have interpreted? 
provided the fact that death and disease level humanity while interpretation is definitely political Dude, I, I couldn't came out came to me broken in between so could you just once again yes, in the uh, if that right. is okay yeah yeah but, uh, yeah, I can see that. Okay, I don't know how to locate the notion of tension and ambiguity in the text that you interpret, provided the fact that death and disease level humanity well interpretation is heavily critical. Thank you so much, Devanjan, for this excellent question. So um, I think I would rather um, I'd rather remind us that each and everything that we're going through right now, um, each and every every aspect of it. Um, interpretation is always political if you're interpreting at, at least uh, interpreting a story i mean of course is by political i do not mean electoral i mean you have an opinion that means this opinion comes from something some sort of a beliefs of faith the quality of it uh, to take part to be opinionated conversation so that that would always be there now whether these stories the ambiguity of these stories the tension that these stories show um the sort of um whether how how they create with the, with the political part of it i think somewhere down the line my understanding is that Chandra, when he wrote lalu he had a message to give and so is um Kipling when he was writing morobi jokes both of them are giving trying to give some sort of a message be it lalu being courageous or with Morobi Jukes being really formidable as a character and then some of the depredation that he finds out. So any description, any aesthetic exegesis will, bow, will be bound uh, by certain political um, or, or, or let's say ideological beliefs. But I, what, what matters to me as a literary critic uh, or as a scholar is that um, what are the strategies that they are choosing to take? I mean, if Kipling is choosing a strategy of describing an atmosphere in a devilish delight, some of the you know language that he deploys, this is also language that is molded and controlled by its time. A language that uh, discourses that reinforce certain discourses which we have come to be seen as imperialist or we have come to be seen as difficult, uh, especially by uh, post-colonial critics. So. For Shorat Chandra, I believe, it is more to do with he doesn't have an audience in Britain or USA or a global audience in mind. He is writing for a Bengali readership mainly. So he his stories, his novels would hardly talk about a British or an European colonial because they would hardly be there in, let's say, uh, you know, some village in Madhinipur or somewhere in Hooghly or somewhere in um, the North Bengal. So the point being that he has to show that, okay, what are the intersections of caste, religion, or something else? How do we how do we find it difficult to talk about that? And this is where the ambiguity I found in Shorat Chandra, much more uh, challenging, not that Kipling was a blunt writer. Kipling is an immensely complex writer. He cannot be brushed aside as somebody who is imperialist. Is the way he writes, see, Kipling, somebody who speaks and somebody who writes, these are two different human beings. The the, uh, the writer is immensely more difficult than somebody who has written some very obscene comments and you try to uh, judge that person, that person's writing by, by that comment. That is something which has always uh, made literary scholars uh, the task difficult, like how to go about that. But that doesn't in any way reduce uh, literary art to some sort of a blunting, some sort of an uh, exposition which is meaningless or which is useless. So in that sense, both of them are dealing with ambiguity, but their audience, their scale, their politics is much more different and even if the death levels both of them that this politics of skill is defining how they are writing and this is what my take about about this question is okay now uh, the second question in line is uh dear shori would you opine that the use of the bengali term mohamari is a colonial construction counter to the pre-colonial coinage uh, morok uh, yes. This is from yes. uh, Shantanu Maji. If I pronounce that correctly, uh, maybe I can put it on the screen for you. Right, right. So, yeah, thanks Shantanu for the question. I think, as I said in the beginning of the uh, of the talk, Mari is. So this is what Aurobindo Shamanto says that uh, this was already there in northern parts of India, especially in Sanskrit and in other texts. And um, I'll just like very quickly give you understanding of it. 
right so this is what he said um, this is page Right, page fifty-five in Aurobindo Savanthu's book *Living with Epidemics in Colonial Bengal*. So historically, he says, historically, cholera seems to have prevailed in South Asia from a very early period. It is mentioned in ancient Sanskrit texts under the names of Sitango or Vishuchi. The Hindu study name was Mari, a deadly disease. A word evidently derived from the same root as the Latin Mori or English Marain. Cholera in many parts of India was called Mari or Judi Mari, that is the sudden pestilence. Or Mahamari, the great pestilence. Now, this is something that he's talking about from the late 18th, early 19th century. So, my feeling is that if the term uh, Mahamari was already there, and I'm sure, like, because some of these languages have been shaping each other, so I'm sure, like in Bengali, the term was already there as well through um, through people who traveled uh, in this part. But Moro, I think, um, is a much more Bengali sized, and if there is something, uh, I, I'm not very sure if there is a there is a particular synonym for it in the uh, Urdu or in the Arabian or the Persian writing. But at the same time, I can see that this had come down to the people of Bengal through already epidemics outside of their own territories. They had known about epidemics, and I'm sure like smallpox had been ravaging parts of Bengal for a long time. So Bengali people, they knew about Morok or, or Mohamari to some extent that it has been there. So the Moha part of it, that it has been, uh, the same Morok is everywhere. The Moha part of it, I think, the great part of it, I think, it takes time for after the British, when the British tried to unify and give a concept of India by bringing different governments and working from different you know, settlements all together. If somebody is having a famine, somebody is having a, an epidemic in Maharashtra, in Punjab or in Chennai, people in Calcutta get to know very fast. Uh, you know, that, that kind of unification of knowledge is coming in the colonial period, I think. Okay. Uh, the third uh, question is. Yes, uh, can you just hold on? Uh, yeah. yeah, we have a few questions from the from the registered participants. So if okay. I may, okay. Yeah. Uh, this is from Roger Shubha Motto. Uh, is yeah. pathologization of epidemic necessarily homophobic, Islamophobic, and chauvinist within the sight yeah. of catastrophic realism? To quote your yeah. point. Yeah. So in a sense, I think, um, thank you again for this question. Um, I think, I think uh, any kind of epidemic, any kind of uh, disruption, an epidemic, as I said, etymologically speaking, that falls on the people, anything that falls, the disaster is also a fall of a star, a meteorite, aster, astro, catastrophe. All of these things are related with the falling of a star. Anything that falls and disrupts normalcy is bound to have its repercussions on humans and their social relationships. So for instance, people who didn't have the vocabulary of talking in the scientific registers that we do these days, such as masks, right? These are all scientific things that we are doing. Throughout uh, the last two, three months, governments have been sort of instructing people through different kinds of media to do these things. Now, this is called campaign, which the British did in the 1860s and 70s about um, the famine, really, and also about later on about the plague and then uh, for the influenza. And then this is when the Indian merchants and then traders would also take part the sort of um, relief committees, etc. The point here being that when there is a disruption before the colonial sort of some 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 of this modern scientific vocabulary was present as i said in, um, in david arnold shows that that how and later on into about the historians that how these things were so deeply cast in. brahmins would give very clear understanding that you know uh, some of these things we cannot touch and then uh, um, and some of these things are actually happening because of um, some of the lower caste people living in uh, utterly shameful and insanitary conditions. This is not my so class, caste, and religion. And some of these lower caste people, of course, would inevitably be going back to either Dalits or Muslim or whatever is not working or is not you know taking part in um, the same kind of uh, same kind of uh, specialized and class-based trajectory and. Uh, Sasha Tendon, the another paper that I quoted from, she goes on to show how uh, even natives, be it uh, Muslim, be it Hindu, be it Jain, or be it um, from another religion, they all religiously uh, sort of made like prevented uh, 
any kind of scientificatory or any kind of state ordained uh, inoculation measures in the beginning they said that you cannot kill rats because in hinduism and in jainism you cannot kill rats and then some somebody would probably be giving sort of this sort of um, you know the, the lay the lay so uh, the cages for catching rats and somebody would actually at, at night would take it out and these are all incidents that are coming in the police reports uh, these these cages will be taken out and you know sort of thrown into the pond so in a sense uh, there is an in initial um, sort of very strong uh, resistance to all of these modernizing strategies which is already there i'm sure in many parts still there many parts of our country as well point being here is that if there are resistances and if there are disruptions that are changing social relations of course conservativeness relating to caste and religion will also increase and that is precisely where the phobia part comes in and this is precisely where literary writings and in general writings cultural writings would give us an understanding about how some of these phobias or some of these opinions actually were laid out in paper because you, you these people are not living right so you don't know what they said but they wrote something and they came out in a formal manner so when we read them we know we understand that the realism part of it okay, was so much influenced by the catastrophic part of it. So that is where I would be uh, giving you the answer that, of course, there were, it, it gave birth to some different kinds of phobias and how these phobias were uh, maintained in social life is something that some of these literary and aesthetic writings would give us an entry point into. Thank you. Uh, Sneha, do we have any more questions? Uh, yes, there is a question uh, from Modumita Bishya. Uh, she asks, you stated during your lecture that uh, the problem with epidemic is that unlike war, disease cannot be represented. But then time and again, we find world leaders as well as health workers constantly using war references in the context of Corona pandemic. How do you read this analogy of crisis in our contemporary capitalist world? Do you think it is incorrect to use the analogy? And if so, why? Yeah, that's a great question again. Thank you. Um, I think the problem with war and Corona is that with any, it's not only about Corona, it's any kind of epidemics is that if it is a bacterial and viral uh, scale, we know the scale is wide, plenty of people are affected, but we don't know why. I mean, we can't blame a virus and look at some of the representations of the coronavirus. It is funny the way people are, uh, some of these emoticons and emojis, they are not blaming the virus as such. Right? It is impossible to blame a virus. You never know the subjectivity of a virus as such. Of course, you never know another animal. You never know another species, another being, how it is thinking. Point is to blame a system, right? But they are blaming either like, the, the lack in China of, of, you know, sort of communication. They are blaming the health systems in Italy or, uh, you know, some of the migrant problems in uh, the Ripper in India, some of the impacts that this virus has led to, what we can represent um, and then there we're talking about how um, the health workers are working uh, like soldiers in an actual and see this is the thing it's an actual war virtual war this is so this is something going on that they are also already always leading at the front these health workers um, as soldiers so to say um, sacrifices you know remember the sacrifice the meaning i said from david arnold's essay that somebody who will be sacrificed at the expense of the population so that is a meaning coming back again as well some of the doctors saying that they are not being treated well by their own landlords etc just shows that they have been taken as some sort of a sacrifices the bare body in or bare life in a more convenient sense but the point to come back to this question is that whether the analogy stamp I think in a war, you can still know who the enemy is and you are fighting with them. Of course, not all the wars have similar kinds of enemies, but the actual war. And when they say war, they remember either the Cold War or the World War or something like that. Whenever or for India, maybe like the war, war of maybe World War itself, or the war of uh, independence, uh, Indian mutiny, you remember then certain events certain events that happened. It's a war, a global. Boris Johnson said, uh, Prime Minister of Britain, that in peacetime, we have never seen uh, this sort of a catastrophe. This is a war situation. Then uh, Macron in France said war. Everybody almost said war. Now, what is happening is that we are in war with an enemy, which we cannot see, which is impalpable, which doesn't have a form. We don't know what form it has. And how do we give form to this formless violence? 
and this is precisely where what is coming out is anthropomorphic imagery mostly that how humans are suffering how migrants are suffering how health workers are suffering so so the when the analogy with war stands the mechanism of it the comparison is precise is very different is very different from where what a war imagery or war representation uh, that is done uh, mostly in poems or in stories or in films saving private ryan or any kind of war film schindler's arc etc schindler's list will give you a different idea um, but maybe the repercussions the emotions the affects might have similar convergence this is precisely why a war is also a disaster I and mean, disasters will always give you similar um, responses but maybe they will be aesthetically and um, sort of character i mean if i can use the term characterially different um, as a war or as, as a fighter so this is this is my understanding that the analogy stands of course but there are these differences that we have to remember as well when we represent I think we have one more question, sir. Can you make one more question? Yeah, one more question. Thanks. Uh, so this is Stella Biswas asking, sir, why do these writers consciously adopt a gothic spectral mode of dealing right. with an issue which they are struggling to grapple right. with? Right. 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 Yes. Um, thank you again uh, for this question. So. Um, I, I believe that the, the, the immediate response to going back to horror or the Gothic is because the dominant mode of realism, the describing social reality in a framework such as in Pondit Moshai or hard times, or maybe I'm not talking about the, all of these are social realism, but if we remember some of these novels, how they, real, how they reproduce the world outside in a framework that does not transgress boundaries in a more palpable manner that Harry Potter does. Does does it mean that Harry Potter doesn't have a reality in its Harry Potter-esque world? It does. Everything is going on in normal world that we can associate to. They're eating, they're walking, they're reading. But at the same time, the borders, the aesthetic borders have been transgressed. They can fly or they can do something with their magic wand. So in a sense, to come back here, also, uh, you know, if you remember some of these stories, Troilok Konath Mukhyopadhyay stories, you know, sort of the Domru Chorik stories, where somebody would go into the, this is a funny story, you know, sort of go, get, would be eaten by a crocodile and would be sort of, you know, realize later on the storyteller will say that even, even, even though he was, she was uh, eaten up, uh, she, would, she was a seller vegetable uh, as a vegetable vendor uh, seller she would be selling vegetables inside the belly of this uh, of this crocodile it's a very funny story i'm not uh, getting into that point being that this is not reality right but we know that the description is happening in a realistic manner now these are the transgressions we need to understand that when it comes to defining a disaster representing a catastrophe that we are not being able to understand what we get back to is the impact that it has. The impact is always in terms of death, the dead bodies. And the dead bodies coming back to haunt us that we have not been able to take care of them. And this haunting nature automatically finds form in the Gothic and the and the um, sort of the horror genre or the subgenre, rather than a social. It is not that there will not be novels about the epidemic in a social realist format or a realist or a modernist format. I mean, like I was telling you about the book Viral Modernism, where Elizabeth Woodka is writing how uh, uh, Mrs. Dalvey or P.S. Eliot's The Westland, they're drawing upon the epidemic or Thomas Mann's novel, um, the sort of, um, uh, and um, uh, uh, Pale Horse and Pale Rider um, by Catherine and Porter, the long short story. These are all about the epidemics, they're dealing with the epidemics, and they're not. But at the same time, you'll see that the representation in delirium, in fever, they're transgressing boundaries. It becomes very difficult for us to not go back and use a form that because it is so difficult for us to understand we use forms strategies that will go beyond transgress the boundaries of cognitive frameworks such as you know conventional understanding of realism that doesn't mean realism is reduced to only a few conventions realism is itself a very radical tool as i have uh, commented elsewhere so point being that this is precisely why they go back that doesn't mean that peopling story is not realist it is just the tropes that he is using it shows that reality can be so versatile so radical and so expensive thank you sir so much thank you for sharing your time with us and thank you for this intellectually stimulating session we hope to have you back again if we organize another webinar. Ma'am, uh, would you like to say something, Professor Fraser? 
I, I just want to add one more thing to this whole fascinating discussion, and that is, again, commend Shorit for one more point, and that is, when Shorit, you bring up Kipling, you show the, colo you show the colonial gaze, uh, which is without empathy for the other. Who, who who dominates Kipling's story, and you, uh, I, I, as against Shorchandra's story, which has, uh, which writes from within the context, with compassion for the sufferer. So I think those two points in the story, one, the Western gaze, which others, the Indian suffer suffering body. Sorry, you got disconnected, I think. Uh, okay. I think the man's got. Uh, I see Mr. Rosen. Right. Would you respond to that, sir? Or? I think. Thank you. No, I would like just to add that. Thank you so much for organizing this webinar, and I look forward to the next speakers as well. And thank you. You're doing a fantastic job. I know that these things can be very difficult maintaining with technical glitches, etc. But all the best, and I'm sure like your viewers will be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. <coughs> uh, the so our next speaker the... has joined us, <laughs> Dr. Anush Basu has joined us in the studio, and we will begin with the session. Sir, if you are ready, we will commence with this session. We are already live. So, uh, sir, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so shall we just begin this with your permission? Sure. Okay. Uh, allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Anushtu Basu to give a brief bio note. Uh, Dr. Anushtu Basu's uh, title of uh, talk today would be on epidemics and modern governmentality. Dr. Anushtu Basu is an associate professor in English, media, and cinema studies and criticism at the University of Illinois at Urbana campaign. He is the author of Feminism, which is forthcoming from Duke University Press in the year 2020. Um, his second work, Bollywood in the Age of New Media, the Geotelevisual Aesthetic, uh, Edinburgh 2010, and he is the co-editor of the volume Intermedia in South Asia, the fourth screen for Rulich in the year 2012, and Figurations in Indian Film from Grave Macmillan 2013. His essays on film, media, culture, philosophy, and politics have appeared in journals like A Boundary 2, Semiotic Inquiry, Journal of Human Rights, Postscript South Asian History and Culture, Postmodern Culture, and Critical Quarterly. Uh, so we'd like to welcome you today. Thank you. Over to you. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, as the case may be. Uh, Sir, sorry to disturb you, but you are not audible yet. So, could you just probably move towards the microphone? Uh, uh, can you hear me now? I uh, know, sir. That's. I'll, 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 I'll do the mic. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? It's a little better. Could, if it's, it's a little you, better. I'm sorry. It's, uh, I'll try something else. Uh, I think it's better when you sit close to the laptop, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to. Yeah, right now you are clearly audible. Okay. Is 
Is that better? Yes. Yes. Sir. Okay. So uh, um, I would like to begin by thanking the uh, organizers uh, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, it's been quite stimulating uh, these couple of days. Uh, let me begin by stating what should be obvious. Now, in the current circumstances, at least, uh, the specter of climate change, recent scholarly meditations on the Anthropocene, hurricanes and other natural disasters sort of regularizing themselves in recent years, along with pandemics like COVID-19. <clears throat> All these factors should uh, freshly alert us to something that we perhaps always knew that uh, despite our anthropocentric delusions, perhaps uh, we may come to terms with what Marx said in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, that humans make history, but not of their own free will, uh, not under the circumstances they have themselves chosen. In that same spirit, we can begin by recognizing the microbe as a bona fide historical actor. Not a mediating factor, a catalyst, or ingredient, but as an authentic agent that ignites historical changes, often with great consequences. The examples, of course, are many. It has been a matter of serious historical concern as to what extent the plasmodium causing malaria eroded the mighty Roman Empire. The bacterium causing, uh, causing the bubonic plague was a central agent in bringing down feudalism in many parts of Europe. The genocidal conquest of the new world perhaps would have been impossible or at least much more difficult without the lethal microbe armies that arrived from Europe and caused smallpox, measles, typhus, or influenza. Or take the eventual formation of the United States itself, uh, you know, as a dominant power. To what extent did the yellow fever causing RNA-based flavivirus shape the destiny of the United States? In 1791, the Haitian Revolution broke out against European colonists in San Domingo. The revolt, led by self-liberated slaves, went on for roughly 13 years. More than anything else, what settled the military conflict were the outbreaks of yellow fever. The native population, by and large, was immune to the virus. The French troops sent by Napoleon were not. The debacle, among other things, cooled Napoleon's interest in the new world. He decided to withdraw. One of the major outcomes of that decision was to sell about 828,000 square miles of continental North America for $15 million to the Jefferson administration in 1803. As we know, the Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the United States overnight and set it on a path of imperialist expansion and genocide. It was a historical trajectory that perhaps could not be imagined for a nation that began with 13 colonies in the north and eastern seaboard in 1776. So with this, with this backdrop, let me come to what I will be focusing on today. I will be talking about a set of key social transformations in the European context, primarily changes in sovereignty, government, civic institutions, medicine, science, and a range of activities from town planning to inoculation that we, broadly speaking, associate with that thing called capitalist modernity. Uh, I will stick to Europe, but hopefully, well, since this model uh, of modernity has been, as we know, exported across the world, 
hopefully during the Q&A, we will be able to bring in other context, uh, contexts as well. Much of what I will elaborate will be familiar to some of you. I apologize for testing your patience, but hopefully the critical interface with the current situation that I uh, hope to set up will furnish new opportunities for thinking. This was a period of change roughly from the end of the 18th century to the end of World War II that Michel Foucault has famously read in terms of a template he calls governmentality. I will come to that eventually. But here is what I'm trying to get at. There were, of course, many motivating factors behind this many armed thing called modernity. However, I think to a good extent, to a satisfactory extent at least, the great transformation can be read in terms of a society altering itself to prepare for a perpetual war against the microbe. Seen in that light, the story becomes, in a sense, that of a reordering of life, cities, and institutions to protect and secure against the microbe menace, the major entities we associate with Western modernity, nation, people, capital, and empire. In the first part of the story, therefore, the microbe is an actual actor in the theater of history. In the second part, it is a metaphor or maybe a ghostly presence. I'll come to that later. Here we will look at whether and to what extent the political template of liberal, liberal modernity has itself actually been defined in terms of things we associate with epidemic and its prevention, health, immunity, contagion, etc., etc. This is a mode of power that Foucault calls biopolitics, as we know. Then we will enter into a brief conversation with the Italian philosopher Roberto Esposito and see whether and to what extent the works of the modern can be read in terms of what he calls the immunity paradigm. That is, whether all functions of the modern state, you know, economy, army, uh, race relations, everything, um, whether all functions of the modern state can be understood analogously in terms of fighting political contagions. Modern humans seek immunity for the economy against downturns, immunity for the race against degeneration, for the nation against dissipation, for the body politic against terrorism, and so on and so forth. <coughs> Let me, however, start with a short account of a titanic explosion, the biggest in recorded history, equivalent to 2.2 million little boys, the atom bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. This was the volcanic explosion of Mount Tambora in modern day Indonesia in the year 1815. The cataclysm buried an entire Sambawan civilization and disrupted global seasonal cycles, affecting radical shifts in temperature and rainfall for several years. Parts of Europe witnessed snowfall in July. In England, 1816 was called the year without summer. In Germany, it was called the year of the beggar. The massive amount of Ash released in the upper echelons of the Earth's atmosphere stayed there for years and produced the bloody surreal sunsets that Joseph Turner would paint. In Tambora, the explosion that changed the world, his magnificent book on this uh, event, highly recommend. My friend and colleague, uh, Gillen Darcy Wood, points out that the eruption's looming presence can be registered in the Gothic atmospherics of Mary Shelley's 1818 novel, Frankenstein. Uh, it is there in the ode that 
John Keats wrote in the autumn of 1819. Many human societies were, of course, changed utterly, and the world was afflicted with a relentless cycle of drought, disease, and poverty. Among the various social, political, and existential outcomes that Gillen meticulously charts in his work, a significant one is that of the cholera wave of 1817. Beginning in Bengal, the outbreak would start a cycle of roughly half a dozen pandemics that would periodically rock the world throughout the long 19th century. The global spread would be in perfect alignment with trade routes. It would change the dynamics of colonialism. The pandemic, pandemics would, would severely dent confidence in bourgeois-led progress in the colonial project and in the future of the world market. Breeding in the slums of London as well as Calcutta, cholera would draw attention to gross economic inequalities. Gillen points out that in Europe, the outbreaks more or less evenly coincided with revolutionary insurrections in 1831, 32, 1848, 1871, etc. Sanitization, sanitation for the poor and the unwashed would emerge as the greatest social justice issue of the 19th century, along with class exploitation and slavery. Gillen points out that cholera was never romanticized in literature like uh, TV, for instance. That was perhaps because death was so sudden and so utterly disgusting. Um, rather, in the words of historian Christopher Hamlin, cholera operated like the conscience of the 19th century. In Europe, cholera, the mysterious disease, caused panic at a scale not seen since the medieval Black Deaths. However, times, of course, had changed. Europe had to absorb the violence and keep its projects going. It had to alter its social structures, its cities, its signs and instrumentation in order to do that. So from a wide angle historical perspective, it had to maintain an optimum laboring population for the flourishing of the capitalist mode of production between the first and second industrial revolutions. It had to reserve people for servicing the empire. It could not, for instance, afford to lose one third of its population to the disease as it did during the 14th century plague. Or even, for that matter, 10% of its folks as it happened with smallpox in the 18th century. Nor could Europe preserve itself by withdrawing from sea trade and imperialist missions and turn isolationist like Japan under the Shogunate. Then, from the purely medical point of view, there were several key problems when it came to cholera, uh, and I'm sure sure it uh, talks about this. Um, there, it was mysterious. Uh, it was a mysterious disease. Nobody knew what caused it and how exactly uh, it spread. That is, it was not known that it was germs that caused cholera and it was a waterborne disease. For a good part of the 19th century, Western medicine was dominated by Gallens, the Roman physician, Gallens' miasma theory, which postulated that diseases were caused by inorganic vapors that emerged from decomposing flesh and then were carried by air. Cholera was Thus thought to be airborne for a long time. It was only in the last quarter of the, of the century that the miasma theory was finally put to rest. Robert Koch identified the bacterium Vibrio cholerae in 1883. Inoculation arrived only in 1885 and the vaccine in 1892. It was certainly a pretty rough ride. Cholera would claim the exiled king 
Charles X of France in, uh, excuse me, in 1836, and the American president, James Polk, in 1849. Between 1847 and 1851, it would kill a million people. Yet it was in this period of shift from mercantilism to capitalist nationalist economies between the Scottish Enlightenment, Enlightenment featuring David Hume and Adam Smith and the invention of the modern high pressure steam engine in England, between revolution and the installation of the Napoleonic Code in France, or with the transformational theorizations of the Enlightenment modern state and civil society in the German idealist tradition of Kant and Hegel. While all of these things was going on, something happened. What was ushered in was a many armed transformational process. It involved new determinations of sovereignty and power, new ways of organizing and archiving knowledge, new communicative relations between disciplines, new imaginations of urban spaces and municipal order, novel methods of accounting and mathematizing, and indeed new medical bureaucracies exercising power and control over not just doctors, patients, and hospitals, but the social sphere as a whole. It is a dispensation that Foucault describes in terms of what he calls biopolitics and governmentality. Unlike other classic Foucauldian terms, sovereignty, which is exercised over a territory and discipline, which targets individual bodies, governmentality and biopolitics involve masses. The shift was, of course, not necessarily dictated by any master plan by the new bourgeoisie. Rather, it was an ensemble of changes, often unconscious readjustments to opportunities as well as dangers. As a whole, according to Foucault, the shifts were prompted by three major concerns of security. Security against food shortage or disease, circulation, and milieu. Now among the three, <coughs> milieu is a special concept. It existed in biology after Lamarck and in physics after Newton. Let us refresh our memories. Milieu in this specific technical sense is not just a historical setting or context. Rather, it's a geometrical abstraction of the setting in terms of bodies and forces their mutual distances and alignments, and their dynamic interactions. It is a mathematical reckoning of actions, circulations, and causality. The milieu has a set of natural givens, that is, rivers, marshes, hills, etc. And then it has a set of artificial givens, dams, roads, miasmas, space, overcrowding, hygiene, sanitation, etc. So the, the, the question of the milieu is how to integrate the natural with the civic uh, in a state of concord and balance and efficient execution. Now, let's say, uh, so it is a conjunction of events produced by individuals, communities, and natural processes. Now, let us say a germ enters the milieu. The question then becomes that of introducing novelties and controlling controls such that the secure circulation continues unabated. That is, the circulation of bodies, merchandise, money, and air. Air because diseases are circulated through air. In other words, uh, good air rather than the foul air or night air of miasma. In a certain sense, as we can immediately identify, this was a process of It involved human frameworks of prognosis, stock taking, and action to meet famines or pestilence without blaming Fortuna or the anger of the gods. 
We are, for instance, quite familiar with the range of economic measures that had been instituted to prevent food scarcity. You know, we're still familiar with these because they're still used to prevent food shortage, price control, right to store, prohibition of hoarding, limits on export, etc. But the important point is that whether it be crops or the management of microbes, the concerns of security and governmentality had to be global with an eye on the world market. Unlike Foucauldian discipline, which encloses and focalizes on the individual body, governmentality is centripetal in its operations. After all, the microbe can arrive and enter, uh, arrive and enter the milieu from anywhere. It could begin its westward journey on a boat from Canton or in the body of a pilgrim to Mecca. Similarly, the American Civil War would interrupt the, the circulation of cotton and capital between southern plantations and Manchester Hills, as Marx analyzed in the third volume of Capital. The interactive dynamism of the milieu would, of course, be quickened by the railroad and steamship. Uh, its geography would be relentlessly extended with the shrinking of the planet. In this age of incessant air travel, we know how fast COVID-19 spread from a local market in China to 213 countries as of now. Uh, almost 200 years ago, the cholera epidemic that started in Bengal in 1826 would reach East Europe in 1831, five years later, USA in 1932 and Mexico in 19, in, sorry, uh, 1832 and Mexico in 1833. Secondly, the mechanism of governmentality was necessarily about, not necessarily about generating new knowledge. New knowledge was of course there, but a lot of it was either old knowledge or imported knowledge that had to be processed in a particular, within a particular system. The uniqueness of the governmental mechanism lay in organizing knowledge, archiving observations, statistically processing insights, achieving regularities, and then executing measures on a mass scale. Take smallpox, uh, variolization or inoculation for example. So smallpox inoculation had been practiced in China and India for centuries. It came to England uh, in the first quarter of the 18th century, 1721, via Turkey. Edward Jenner, the, individual, uh, the eventual inventor of a smallpox vaccine, was himself inoculated uh, as a child. I use scare quotes when I say inventor because Jenner, in a purely technical sense, was almost certainly not the first one to uh, vaccinate. That is, he was not the first one to notice that milkmaids who always developed cowpox scabs as an occupational hazard almost never suffered from smallpox. He was not the first one to introduce pus from cowpox blisters into a human body as a protective measure against smallpox. There were several others in England and wider Europe who had done exactly that during earlier pandemics. Jenner's contribution lay in clearly establishing at the level of scientific protocols and experimentations, uh, experimentation guidelines, two things. One, this measure was an assured protection against smallpox. And two, it could be cultured from one human body to another, leaving the cow alone. It was a governmental mechanism that therefore subsumed a folk remedy with an, ap uh, with an epistemology still dominated by the classical legacy of Hippocrates II and Galen. Not just that, it made it a measure of public health executed on a, on a mass scale. So that was key. Within a few years, Napoleon had vaccinated his entire army with this British discovery while fighting the British. What is crucial here, as Foucault points out, that it was the statistical instruments of the time that established inoculation as an 
as absolutely preventive and vaccination as certain cure. Now, I should clarify uh, the, the two terms here since they get mixed up. Inoculation uh, basically means introducing small uh, doses of the same virus into the body so that the body develops immunity uh, through a mild form of, it, uh, of the illness. Vaccination, on the other hand, is the introduction of germs of a different non-human disease, cowpox, for example, uh, or, you know, uh, later it would become chemically weakened germs uh, in order to achieve the same result. But the important point here is that the truth of vaccination was initially a medical practice, but it wasn't a medical truth. It was a mathematical truth. In other words, Europe went on vaccinating for decades without knowing, as per medical logic, how or why it works. And this sort of relates to what Cholit was uh, saying about the impossibility of uh, representing the, uh, the, the virus. So Europe did that uh, as an assured measure of public works, not as localized or individual leaps of faith as it was in the past. It would take the arrival of the condenser, condenser lens system and color illumination in modern microscopes and the triumph of germ theory in the hands of Pasteur, Koch, and Ferdinand Cohn to find a medical explanation as to how exactly vaccinations work. This paradigm shift, germ theory that is, would end two things. The dominance of Gallen's miasmus theory and the theory of spontaneous generation synthesized initially by Aristotle which argued that living matter could rise from non-living matter. Like it, it was believed that maggots, for instance, could rise from rotting flesh. Uh, it was this victory of the germ theory that would make quarantine a universal practice in Europe. Earlier, it was thought that it was, since it was a matter of foul air, isolation of patients was useless. Modern quarantine became a matter of targeting populations and segmenting space, uh, unlike the medieval measure of exiling the afflicted away from the city to lep leprosaria or leper colonies. Foucault earmarks this as a significant modular shift from the model of religious exclusion in the case of leprosy to the military model, modern military model of isolation and observation for the plague. Vaccination thus became part of a wider mechanism of systemizing chance and probabilities. The medical governance of societies became a matter of acceptable ratios, you know, achieving balance and indeed what we call today flattening the curve. But all this based on a newly emergent concept of the population. That is, since now, we are talking about the middle of the 19th century, let's say. Sovereignty is no longer about the prince and the territory, but the security and health of the population and those who govern it. Population thus becomes a political category within the auspicious of what Foucault calls governmentality. It becomes quantitative, qualitative, and anthropological. Population has to be read in terms of various compositions, gender, age group, ethnicity, wealth, literacy, distribution and space, life expectancy, etc. A continuing micro analysis of the population, death rates versus birth rates, nutrition levels, accidents, suicides, etc. become the bedrock of present and future policy. So in this new order, the king might reign but he can't govern. The task of governing will be delegated to not just functionaries of the state uh, and state bureaucracies, but a group of intellectuals Foucault would call technicians of power. The whole thing was not about a state taking over a society, but a governmentalization of the state. We'll come to this later. As a technician of power, 
the doctor is no longer just a person who treats patients and cures them. Of course, he does that, but he also participates in public works. He advises on necessary salubrious conditions and air corridors in town planning. He advises on common water works and water pu uh, purification, on common sewage and safe garbage disposal. On He advises on new hydrographic maps of the city that separates water works from sewage. The doctor addresses issues of air quality and pollution, swamps and ponds in the milieu, and during epidemics especially, advises on whether to cremate or bury. It is the doctor who shifts slaughterhouses and the graveyard to the periphery of the city and standardizes the individual coffin and the tomb. He aids in dividing the city into medical districts with medical officers registering births and deaths. <laughs> he designs the modern hospital as a clean, scientifically structured space with ideal conditions of uh, light and airflow. This was in stark contrast to the dark, dingy, and unclean hospices of an earlier age where only the poor went to die. In fact, one of the calls of the French Revolution was no more hospitals. Um, along with that, the doctor also invents the modern clinic as an institution for specialized treatment, experimentations, record keeping, pedagogy, and research. The doctor standardizes medical practice and medical knowledge, evicting quacks and charlatans, and trying and tying hospital archives to the university. The doctor's advice is solicited in designing army logistics and strategies in distant lands, or by the naval administration in designing and running naval hospitals that controlled the ports where the disease is coming. This was essential since the construction of the Panama Canal or the late uh, 19th century conquest of Africa would not happen without defeating prime enemies in yellow fever and malaria. More importantly, the doctor consults several archives and talks to other experts as part of an ongoing lateral governmental con conversation in the milieu, about the milieu, in order to keep circulation and population secure and healthy. In an overall effort to keep society on a permanent war footing against the epidemic and other perils. To keep a robust and healthy population, not just safe from disease, but also to supply labor power to the factories and soldiers at the service of empire. The doctor therefore talks with bureaucrats, builders, physicists, chemists, zoologists, agronomists, or botanists. He begins also to talk to people who specialize, specialize in pathological anatomy. It, it sounds very counterintuitive, but for a good part of the early modern era, I mean, there was an anatomy going on, often on the sly, but doctors and uh, you know, people who studied an anatomy did not necessarily talk to each other, uh, at least on a systemic, uh, systemic level. So these conversations were going on. Uh, the lateral movement across disciplines would include eugenics uh, and interest, for instance, in the Norfolk system of breeding disease-free horses or techniques of improving plant pedigrees through crossbreeding. Now, why is this lateral uh, conversation between disciplines uh, important? That is because if you, you know, if you think about the three names uh, I mentioned a little while earlier, uh, three fathers of micro uh, microbiology, uh, among them only Robert Koch was a physician. Cohn, Ferdinand Cohn was a biologist, while Louis Pasteur was a chemist for a greater part of his career. He turned towards bi microbiology and his eventual uh, uh, invention of uh, pasteurization uh, was uh, accidental uh, almost. 
a local wine merchant asked him to study wine fermentation. And after that, a sericulturist hired him to study diseases and silkworms. Pasteur also conducted many of his human experiments at great risk because he didn't have a medical license. So from the governmental angle, the doctor becomes not just a curer of diseases, but an important agent in an overall uh, order of the clinical gaze that surveys society. As Foucault puts it in his essay, The Birth of Social Medicine, he becomes a social hygienist rather than an individual therapist, a master of no so politics rather than simple no so logic. He insists on new bureaucracies, new forms of data gathering, documentation, and processing. He draws novel correlations and new cartographies. He looks for information not just about current maladies, but also biohistorical lessons, like why did the plague uh, fade from Europe in the 18th and 19th century? Why exactly TB, for some weird reason, was on its way out in the 19th century? The medical expert plays a significant role in the supervision and distribution of bodies in space, in schools, prisons, hospitals, or army barracks. He does so not just to fight contagion when it arrives, but to preempt it in the most efficient manner when it does. He focuses on the child, and with the child at the center, obedient. Uh, he insists on the obedient medicalization of the entire family. Uh, he demands new municipal institutions like the local boards of health that emerged in England with the cholera outbreak of 1832 uh, and the eventual health, uh, creation of the health service in 1875, tasked with the mandatory vaccination uh, of the population, amongst other things. Uh, by 1851, the doctor would be attending the first international sanitary conference in Paris. In Paris, now the doctor is all doing all this, for example, in the London of high industry and Dickensian fog and squalor, when the entire world is being turned into the supply chain, the supply chain of London. The doctor becomes, in a larger sense, the detective who diagnoses the root of the malaise afflicting the body politic. Consider the two famous uh, examples of such detective work in the uh, cholera scenarios in London. In 1854, Dr. John Snow was skeptical about the miasma theory, and the foul air theory, uh, used a dot map of clustered cases and knowledge from local interviews to trace the source of the outbreak to a single broad street water pump. They took, you know, as the legend goes, they took the handle of the pump away and the disease stopped. In the summer of 1866, doctor and statistician William Farr, uh, the New York Times just ran a story on him, ran a f um, uh, working with Snow's assumption that cholera is a waterborne disease, trace the source to the pipes of the East London Waterworks Company. So in both cases, it was not just medical knowledge, but a new cartography of, you know, map of water pipes, this and that, uh, municipal outlays that uh, allowed them to do that. The advent of social me uh, medicine or urban medicine in the West was prompted by various historical factors. For Foucault, it was prompted by capitalism and labor force medicine in England. Uh, so labor force medicine in England, uh, it was prompted by republicanism and citizenship in France. And after the 30 years war, the desire to maintain military strength in Germany. So three completely different reasons, but, but it happened. For the first time in European history, the structures of a modern health system were inst installed and public works were directed towards maintaining optimum standards of health and general immunity. A self-disciplining bourgeois elite committed to trade devoid of risk and stop and stopping the, you know, uh, vainglorious military adventures of kings and aristocrats. This bourgeoisie decided that 
it was in their own commercial, military, and health interests to have a healthy population. Where did this lead to? In his remarkable book, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History, Manuel de Landa presents a startling fact. In 1900, not just uh, modern medicine, but modern medical governmentality itself achieved a significant statistical landmark. For the first time in the millennium and probably in history, large Western cities became self-reproductive for the first time. That is, they were able to grow their population on their own without the influence, influx of immigrants. And we have to recall here that in the early modern and medieval period, uh, cities were, you know, mostly associated with uh, ill health and death. Foucault calls this the new order of biopolitics, where the immunization of society as a whole becomes the central feature. That is, biopolitics permeates and replaces, to a certain extent, an older form of sovereignty that is defined as power over life and death. So this was the earlier form of sovereignty. The older sovereign was he who could exercise exceptional violence. That is, he could kill without committing homicide. Now, that form of top-down axiomatic power is set aside for an immanent horizontal mode that focuses on make a life and let die. Make a life, make life, because it focuses on optimizing certain demographic features of the population, birth rate, death rate, nutrition levels, life, expect, uh, life expectancy, etc. Let die, because in its normative functions, this form of power does not seek to actively decimate targeted individuals or groups. It distributes, it distributes classes along, uh, according to different levels of vulnerability and exposure. That, that is, if an epidemic strikes, for instance, or if there's a, a catastrophic economic or natural disaster, the poorer you are, the less protected and insulated you become. Now, Roberto Esposito has an interesting reading of Foucault that I would like to touch upon. With the coming into being of biopolitics and the sidelining of the king, whose word is the law, in other words, the king can no longer govern. govern governing is left to the bureaucracy and the experts. Um, it does not, of course, mean that violence disappears from society. Far from it. Rather, violence is either externalized or internally distributed. It becomes like an inoculation measure. In other words, like a bad germ, you need to circulate in the body in small doses in order to promote general health and immune, immunity. So you do, inoculation means you, you do a small amount of violence to your own body to uh, keep it in better shape. The taking of life or letting die uh, thus now has to be justified in terms of greater good. You may take lives so that more lives can be saved. That is how police is supposed to work or uh, war is supposed to be conducted. So in a political sense, in terms of the social contract, a man sentenced to death has already given consent to, its, uh, to his own kill killing. In other words, he has two bodies, just like the king had two bodies. One of those bodies is the body of the condemned. The other body of the same man is that the abstract body of the citizen who becomes a signatory to his own death, death sentence. In terms of external exercise of violence, we can recall several illuminate, illuminating instances. Uh, colonialism and even slavery were justified because they were for the greater work, uh, good of the natives themselves. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were justified on the grounds that they brought the war to a swift end, saved American lives, and if you extend the logic, even Japanese ones. In the Afghan war at the turn of the century, the United States Air Force dropped yellow food packets and yellow cluster bombs on the same population. One was to make live, the other was to let die. And then back home, there is always the question of the working class and the minorities, the caste, race, ethnic, or gendered minority. One thing that Foucault and Esposito talk about, which I'll not get into in detail today, 
is that the most fierce, most torrid expression of the bio biopolitical in the modern era was Nazism. It stated that the Nazism, what, what the ideology stated, was that the health of the German body, body politic and the purity of the Aryan race could be restored to a state of health only if Jews, and there were others, homosexuals, communists, gypsies, etc. Only of the, if these people were exterminated. They were variously described as vermin, termites, bacteria, etc. As Hitler once said, quote, the discovery of the Jewish virus is one of the greatest revolutions in the world. The battle that we fight every day is equal to those fought in the last century by Koch and Pasteur. This quest for ultimate health and racial purity was a schizophrenic one, uh, an insane one, precisely because the Nazis were ready to inoculate to the point of killing the patient himself. Hitler's famous telegram 71 from, the, from his bunker ordered that the means of survival for the defeated German people should be removed and the race that could not purif purify itself should be allowed to die. What Esposito argues is that perhaps we can understand, we can perhaps understand modern governmentality and biopolitics as a whole through the metaphor of disease fighting. He calls this the immunity paradigm. That is, just as you check your health fundamentals, blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, etc., to get into that statistical curve of an expected lifespan, you immunize yourself and your family against death, accidents, or disability through insurance. You immunize yourself against old age helplessness through pensions and provident funds, and so on and so forth. This is where the micro becomes a metaphor for anything that society must insulate itself from. Poverty, death, disease, or famine. But then there is one feature in this entire thing that I find uh, most interesting and illuminating for our present times. Foucault says that the day-to-day -day objectives of the biopolitical regime are not the handling of exceptional scenarios, not the epidemic that comes once in a while, but the endemic. That is the general health and its everyday little challenges from the common cold to the heart attack. These are your fundamentals. That is how you, you know they're going to come every day or every hour and how you deal with them. It may be assumed that governmentality can confront the exceptional situation with a fair degree of uh, quantifiable success only when the basics are in place, when the state has power in reserve, that is, when the general economy and agricultural production is potent enough to allow for emergency food, stocking, capital liquidity, etc. The management of the endemic decides at the end whether you have enough hospital beds and medicines for the epidemic. It is at this point you can drop the metaphor and return to the real virus. What, when it strikes as it has, what does the virus do? It brings about a lockdown. The lockdown can be understood as a freeze frame of the milieu. It also becomes a kind of X-ray of society and its endemic fundam fundamentals, or you know, a kind of a postmodern mortem while the body is still alive. That is because the microbe threatens in various degrees to cut through all the bufferings and protective blankets. It universalizes a peril that is otherwise dynamic and distributed in the social body. The microbe in different degrees, and difference is important here, threatens the human in the slum as well as the human in the gated community, in the bullock cart as well as in the airplane or the Mercedes. It presents, therefore it makes all boundaries porous, and it presents the picture of uh, what in classical uh, European um, political philosophy would call tanquam dissoluta, the city in a dissolved state. 
That is when all dividing lines between rich and poor, between powerful and powerless, between upper caste and Dalit, between slum and the high rise, all these boundaries, well, they don't disappear entirely, but they are rendered potentially porous. It gives us a glimpse of the secrets of our endemic everyday normalcy. The exceptional turn calls the normal condition to judgment. It imposes imbalances and acute vulnerabilities. It, it, it exposes imbalances and acute vulnerabilities of the social order that were not actually brought about by the pestilence, but they were always there and we just didn't notice them. It gives us the chance to reevaluate values and decide, for instance, at the level of the endemic, who essential workers, for instance, are really are. It allows us to question whether the sewage worker is more essential than the movie star. The outbreak reveals whether and to what extent our health priorities in terms of economy, production, physical security, food security, security of livelihood, and indeed medical security, meet the constitutional parameters of the Republic and our enshrined ideals of social justice. The virus tells us who actually on an everyday basis, without us noticing it, our biopolitical regime is actually making live and who is, who it is letting die. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, Shubham, here, yeah, Andre, uh, you wanted to ask me the questions now. Sir, with your permission, shall we start taking the questions? Yeah, uh, you know, but uh, uh, you, your voice is not coming through. Uh, so can you uh, sir, with now? your permission, would you uh, like to take a few questions? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. so we will go uh, with uh, Shoipa Chok. in the social otherness generates a sense of social immunology that eventually leads to state domination and do you feel uh, quarantine the process of quarantine would eventually lead to criminology well that's a that's an excellent uh, excellent question um you see, the problem, of course, is that um, uh, immunology often works at two levels, right? So it works at the biological level, let's say, uh, when, you know, a person can, um, you know, there, there's enough reason to suspect that that person has been exposed to the virus and should be quarantined. But it also uh, works at the political level all the time. Uh, which i mean for instance there was uh, a certain minister uh, i think from karnataka who said that i will not quarantine myself because i'm a very important person and i have you know important things to do so it, it is uh, the the political medical biopolitical decision in terms of who is uh, going to be quarantined who is going to be criminalized if not quarantined, and who is going to be granted immunity from those imperatives uh, is always a relational interplay uh, within a broader immunity paradigm. That is uh, the question of uh, you know biological uh, 
uh, immunity is never too far from the question of biopolitical uh, immunity. Uh, yeah. So in that sense, uh, you know, all these questions become uh, very interesting. That is, um, uh, like whether, for instance, we could use, um, for instance, you know, if you ask homeless people to quarantine themselves, where, where exactly, you know, uh, do they go? Uh, and uh, it becomes more complicated when you sort of uh, criminalize them if they, if, if, if they don't, do not quarantine themselves. And it, of, of course, becomes a much more interesting question if uh, someone asks this question, as it has been asked, that, uh, well, you know, why don't we use uh, hotels, hotel rooms, sometimes five-star hotel rooms, to, uh, to meet the unusual situation where, let's say, uh, uh, a homeless person might be quarantined there. Uh, can we move on to the next question? Sir, am I audible? Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, this is a question from Shubham Dotto, our colleague at Gokhil Memorial Girls College. He is his question is if uh, of other space in of other spaces while mentioning the second principle of heterotopia, Foucault refers to cemeteries and how they were relocated to the fringes and outskirts of the city in fear of contagion mm -hmm. early in the 19th century. What kind of change in the spatial structure do you envisage in the context of this new pandemic? In, re in relation to that, do you envisage the rise of any institutional apparatus committed to the biopolitics Foucault recurrently mentions? That's a that's a that's a very good uh, question. But um, you see, one of the things that Foucault also talks about all the time is that uh, no central. I mean, it is about centralizing and democratizing power. That you know what I just talked about. Uh, but it doesn't happen necessarily because of a master plan that is executed. You know, uh, that is very consciously executed. Most measures um, are often uh, done unwittingly. Um, for instance, you know, I, uh, about the, the, the things pertaining to town planning that I was talking about, that I mentioned, that, you know, that there was a medical supervision of building construction, drainage, this, that. Creation of air corridors, uh, sewage disposal, creation of air corridors through the city. So buildings were destroyed because they were in the, you know, they were not letting in air from the river, for instance. Now, all these things, uh, a very good part, were done for the completely wrong reasons. That is, they were uh, prompted by miasma theory that it, it was coming through the air, uh, which wasn't true. So, uh, in that sense, what uh, what has happened today is um, calling all of us to, uh, you know, for a restructuration of our habitats and our new segmentation systems. You know, it starts with like questions like, should the middle aisle of all uh, airplanes henceforth be empty? Or, you know, whether in classrooms that used to uh, seat 30 students, there should be only 50. Or whether a class of 30 will alternate one day online and the other day uh, actually being in the class. And uh, and things like that, it's sort of, uh, you know, um, and now that India is opening up, uh, we are asking questions about public transport. We are asking questions about, uh, uh, you know, structuring population movement. We are asking uh, certain offices and certain occupations that can, uh, in that, in those cases, it can be done. People to uh, work for, for uh, some home, 
we are the Unifed. When we talk about the city of Canada, we are find ways of that sea of humanity, you know, to lessen and restructure that sea of humanity that moves towards Dallas Square every morning at 9.30 in the uh, green office. So, and how that can be done, uh, I don't know, but uh, it, uh, you know, it, 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 it will perhaps call for a new form of urban reorganization that I, I believe to a large extent will happen almost unconscious with humans instinctively or customarily uh, sort of responding to uh, changing signals, right? Uh, some of it will happen unconsciously, some of it will be designed and it's going to be a mixture of things. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question from Anuradha Madhunda. She's an associate professor of English from Prafula Chandra College. Her question is a brilliant presentation, sir. Just one point. I agree that lo lockdowns induced by pandemics are the best time to ask if the sewage cleaner is more important to the health of the country than the movie star. How would you respond to the migrant labor crisis in India in the COVID scenario? Aren't they being otherized and treated as expendable now more than ever than before? Well, yes. Uh, I did bring up the, the, the topic of letting die. Uh, you know, uh, letting die, uh, keeping them in mind. So, it is a form of, uh, uh, I mean, you, you call it governmental inertia that doesn't actively kill people, but uh, withdraws uh, at a very critical moment, withdraws their resources for survival. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's utterly, obviously, I find it morally and politically reprehensible, uh, and it is, uh, it is, it is, in a sense, biopolitics, but of uh, the most uh, elemental kind. Uh, so we have another question by. Uh, Debo Mitra Kaur, she's asking the extension of disease metaphor to the biopolitics ensures a sort of exclusivist attitude towards the other. How can that make our boundaries porous? It makes it more fortified. Kindly explain. Uh, so to the Bible, uh, attitude. Uh, yes. Um, the the reason why uh, adoration becomes an important, um, uh, completely different kind of adoration when, when it comes to uh, biopolitics, uh, is because, uh, and this refers back to uh, uh, what Shoni was saying, uh, saying about the uh, representation. Of, the most important thing is that in trusting terms, you can um, spot the other, spot the other uh, in visible options. Uh, there, 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 uh, there will be uh, criteria, which is skin color, eye color, hair color, uh, features. Uh, you know, for the, the secret thread or whatever, uh, language, uh, these treatises let me spread the other. But when we talk of uh, the, the era of the biopolitics, which, as I try to point out, coincides with empire and the formation of a new order of commerce 
Uh, the metaphor of the disease becomes interesting because you can't see the microbe. So in that sense, the other structure the other becomes complicated because you don't know who's carrying the microbe. Now that is just a medical thing, right? Uh, what 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 the Nazis in terms of other issues, what the Nazis here is what we said the name. That is, you know, having sex and children with a Jew without a name. Or having sex and having children with someone who has Jewish blood without you know. So it is in that sense, uh, you know, Hannah Arendt puts it uh, extremely well that in a totalitarian environment, which the Nazi Germany was, everybody becomes a suspect in different ways. Everybody becomes. <clears throat> so there's a universal idea. And then there is a calibration of calibration of lines. You know, okay, this guy is six feet tall, he's blonde, blue eyes, uh, you know, so probably is a alien stuff. And so and so looks like a Jew, so it needs to be important. So my point is that as uh, as uh, as an actual uh, uh, event, medical event, uh, uh, not a logical event, uh, germ contagion is something you can't see. You can't see with naked eyes, you can't see it, you can't see it, you can't see it when it happens, in the exact moment it happens. And uh, when you transfer it to the political dimension, uh, that is also where uh, in a society, and and Zuko reads the primary terms of race, uh, adoration becomes a matter of contagion, and contagion and uh, anxiety over uh, unwitting exposure, anxiety uh, over you know, uh, uh, over dividing lines between suddenly render force. And you see that in what is happening in the United States now. Uh, so a lot of a uh, lot of racism uh, uh, you know uh, of a certain generation in the United States is prompted by fear of integration. Not in a classic sense, let's say, you know, uh, you know, uh, I might sleep with a, a black person without realizing. But also, in, it's intergenerational that uh, uh, racial others or caste others are, you know, coming for for my children and so on. So that you know, at least the cultural and political boundaries that divided the races, divided the class, are increasingly becoming uh, porous. Because, uh, you know, the, the, the segmentation of spaces in society is changing. The Dalit, you, you could, uh, you know, absolutely forbid from your, you know, from your township, let alone your home, uh, let's say 100 years ago, uh, he's sitting with you in, in a classroom. That's it, right. So th that is the uh, 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 and and that person is uh, is uh, metaphysical. It's called right? uh, So that that is uh, the, the the anxiety that I am um, trying to explain. I, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Neha, Pierre, do we have any more questions? Uh, I don't think so, Andrew. We have any more. Let me just go through it quickly. No, I don't think so. Thank you, sir, for you know sharing your time with us and you know it was such an enlightening session. Uh, you no, know, there is a uh, uh, sorry to intervene. There is a question by Devanjan Mitra. Oh. Uh, sorry to intervene. There is a question by Devanjan Mitra. 
Okay, uh, sir, may I read it out? Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, how do you distinguish between the notion of caregiver and the role of statistics extracting record keeper in the context of your talk regarding biogovernance? Well, uh, so, you know, the super makes this distinction between uh, the individual parents, right? So, the doctor, you know, you know, the classic figure of the doctor, uh, the, the family surgeon, this uh, person is called, is uh, someone who interacts with the patient on a one to one basis. Right. So this is the uh, transposition that we know in the in the late 80s and early 19th century that uh, the doctor is not just a nosologist, he's also a nosopolitist. That is, you can see patients, of course, but uh, as an expert of uh, uh, you are, uh, as an expert of the medical profession, you are, your advice is sought for by a government, right? So it is in that sense an extension of uh, the doctor addressing not just the individual patient, but the months, right? So when, you know, uh, Edward Jenner uh, furnishes his findings to the Royal Society of Medicine, uh, Royal Society, uh, Society of Physicians, and they accept it. Uh, that is a process that was not done before. That is making it uh, a prescript, prescriptive for the entire people. That is, okay, now let us do something. Let us uh, give this vaccine to all the patients in Britain. So that the doctor effectively, uh, you know, uh, devises a remedy for millions of people he has never seen or will not see. So that was uh, the, uh, that's the distinction that and similarly, you know, with the, with the, uh, it's not just about medical procedures. The doctor is, uh, the doctor's advice is solicited for everything in terms of how an entire society has to be medicalized. And, the, you know, in the modern figure of the surgeon general, whose, uh, you know, advice you see in cigarette packets, from cigarette packets to, you know, everything, how what exactly, how exactly to wash hands during a uh, COVID outbreak. This is uh, the, the dispensation uh, where the doctor sort of uh, exceeds his, as a technician, uh, exceeds uh, his uh, classical role as uh, an individual therapist. And this is how the doctor sort of addresses the population in mass rather than just one person. Uh, I don't think we have any other questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us and you know, um, for, for sharing your time with us and uh, for this wonderful lecture. We have received a lot of warm responses from our participants about this lecture. Hopefully, you will join us again for if we organize another webinar. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a uh, Yes. Yes, Arti, uh, the HOD has joined us. I'm trying to add on that. Am I audible? Uh, oh, yes. yes. Yes, sir. The second is there. Oh. Also there. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 Um.
am i audible Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. You are audible. Yes, oh, you are. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, Shudipto, do you do you want to say something before I start? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'd yes. I'd like to I'd like to say a few words. Uh, first of all, uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, I want to thank all our distinguished speakers for delivering such informative, scholarly, and insightful talks. we got to know so many things about the nature not just of our present pandemic the covid 19 uh, but that of all pandemics in history we got to learn that just just a society culture and politics uh, shape our perception our experience our how we represent pandemics but also uh, but pandemics themselves in turn uh, influenced our politics and culture uh, next i want to thank our principal dr atosh karfa for allowing us to organize this webinar and also for our valuable inputs uh, i want to thank all my fellow faculty members uh, especially rajkumar da Mr. Rajkumar Borman, HOD, for his waver, unwavering support. Whenever we faced a problem or hit an uh, obstacle, an obstacle, he was there to solve those problems. I want to especially thank Mr. Shubham Datto and Dr. Wendy Rai for contacting our speakers. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Wendy Rai, uh, Ms. Sneha Pan. Mr. Uh, Shubham Datto and Ms. Phupu Lamu Sherpa for hosting and anchoring the sessions of our webinar, and it was a really trying jo job, and you have done wonderfully. And I I want to thank all our students, for they are the real source of our inspirations, and I thank all the participants for their unfailing and continued support and last but not least i want to thank my department for letting me be a part of this effort i'm genuinely proud of you all so thank you uh, now i am coming to the formal formal vote of thanks am i audible yes 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 you are audible the last three days have been very special for the department of english gokule memorial girls college as i was checking just a few minutes back our youtube channel has been viewed by some prachwanta your voice is breaking uh, i guess the connectivity is creating some problem i yeah, was struggling with that you are audible okay, please okay. go ahead Well, the reason, the reason behind this huge success is, of course, our internationally acclaimed speakers who positively responded and delivered their valuable lectures on the topic epidemics, body and medicine inquiries through literary and cultural texts, in which various aspects of pandemics have been discussed, like ecological crisis, salvation from pandemic, women's role of transfer of trans. to transform pandemic situations how body becomes the tool of resistance and subversion portrayal of pandemic in cinema role of states during this crisis situations of migrant laborers historical perspectives of pandemic what is colonial about epidemics So I, on behalf of Gokhale Memorial Girls College Department of English, express my sincere thank to Professor Dr. Bashavi Fraser, not only for our talk on "From the Beginning, Salvation Comes," but also for being to taking up some responsibilities of the 
seminar by yourself words fail to thank you ma'am professor dr amrit sen no doubt you are certainly an extended part of the department your insightful lectures have always inspired countless scholars academicians and students and your talk on let the boundaries of this village become our whole world women and the plague in year of wonders is not an exception so i extend a very hearty vote of thanks to dr shen a big thank you to dr ananya ghoshal for your beautiful presentation through slides some important sections of the seven seal based on black death in europe i must mention our deep sense of appreciation for dr minu susan koshi for your emphatic assertion on politics and pandemics i would also like to thank and congratulate monikornika dotto for her presentation and for her interactive session with our students further i take this opportunity to thank dr shourit bhattacharya for colonialism in his talk i wish to express my gratitude to dr anushtu basu for a wonderful and splendid presentation of thought provoking topic epidemics and modern governmentalities we are also grateful to our principal ma'am dr atoshi karfa for the necessary permission and support for organizing this webinar i must thank our listeners for so patiently listening and watching our program during the last 3 days finally i thank Shurobhi Roy and Tanmay Kundu, from whom we got the idea of broadcasting our program. Through StreamYard, and last the last few weeks to make the webinar a big success. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. So shall we end the broadcast now? Yes, sir. 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 Yes, and uh, hope to meet you again in these troubling times and hope you cope with these troubling times very well in your own ways and hope you get out of the depression that this troubling time has cast on you in different ways and hope to meet you again through this virtual medium very soon with different speakers with different topics and with uh, different ways of presentation thank you so much for listening to us thank you for supporting us and thank you for uh, making this uh, webinar series a grand success it's all for you it's all for the listeners it's all for the students and it's all for the colleagues and uh, my heart thanks to all my colleagues uh, ohindri roy uh, rajkumar bormon fufu lamu serpa uh, sneha pan Shudipto Mondol, all of you, for your constant support to make this a grand success. Thank you thank so you much. Ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank we will try to. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You don't okay. get to enter it. Enter the broadcast then. Okay. Yeah, let's enter the broadcast and take the discussion else. Okay. Okay.